Chapter 551 Spare No One The air was stultifying, filled with the scorching heat of the sun, but the witchers had expressions as frigid as ice. Some of the peasants wilted under the witchers' reproachful looks, and they hung their heads low, muttering and cursing under their breaths. Some of the nobles shrank in silence, while the guards, Cyrus and Tarika, glared at them murderously. The bards and the patrons of the ballroom stared at the witchers, their eyes shining. The knights could see the white wolf who was standing within the group of witchers. They exchanged a look and heaved a sigh of relief. With Geralt making his appearance, they were one step closer to finding Ciri. The mercenaries hiding within the crowd sneered, as if their plan had finally worked. The mutants had to give in after all. The dwarves, elves, and part elves had conflicted looks on their faces. The fate of the witchers was nothing short of a prophecy to them. They too were non-humans. If the witchers were judged despite their innocence due to sheer ignorance, then who was to say they would not fall into the same circumstance in the future? The plaza, once again, was plunged into chaos and cacophony. You shouldn't be here. What about the orphanage? Roy muttered to his companions. Sarat turned around and looked at him. Too late to backtrack, kid. We have to push on. If they want peace, then we would have left them alone. Keon hissed coolly. But should they yearn for war, then they shall find themselves waking up in the burning hells, Letho added tersely. He'd had enough of these fools' unfounded prejudice. They wished for nothing but peace, but all we wanted was to be left alone, and yet they wished to back us into a corner. Vesemir looked at the crowd around them, his emotions conflicting. This scene reminded him so much about that battle in Kaer Morhen a hundred years ago. This time, I shall not run. The guards surrounded the witchers, and Cyrus scanned them, delighted. They take the fight to us, to our turf. They've lost their advantage. There was wariness in his eyes as well, and unbridled contempt. He had no idea a group of witchers had made their home near his abode, and seeing them gathered in the plaza only intensified the impact of that reality. He was old and experienced enough to know how dangerous these mutants were. They were unpredictable, uncontrollable. Should anything go wrong, these mutants could destroy Novigrad as it was, they must be eradicated. Fifteen of you and one-third are nothing but children. Cyrus clicked his tongue. Coldly, he judged. Witness their sins, citizens. This is proof of their evil experiments. The boys snorted in disdain, refuting the hierarch's claim. They were young, wet behind the ears, inexperienced, and a little nervous. They'd never been in front of this big a crowd before, and they were a little excited about this show they were putting on. They shivered, eager to go. Do not change the subject, Cyrus. Roy stepped ahead. As per the citizens' request, my brethren are here. What are you waiting for? Come forth, Tarika. Find the butcher. See if he's among us. Worry not, child. We have many witnesses here. Cyrus sneered at the witchers. The mutants wouldn't try to butcher everyone. If the witchers resorted to violence in this circumstance, then no matter the reason, the people would see them as evil incarnate. Novigrad would never allow them to stay. Despite the guard's protection, Tarika still shivered. She clasped her hands and gritted her teeth. Then she approached the witchers, scanning their faces. Everyone's eyes followed hers. When they saw Kian's scarred, disfigured visage and crimson eyes, the people gasped. Is that even a human? Was he thrown into a fire? No, must have been the mutation. Evil mutation. Kian ignored the disgust and contempt shown by the crowd. He held his head up proudly. He had his brothers by his side, a bunch of students he must protect, and a woman who loved him. He cared not for these people's opinions. He was not the on, lie one who held his head high. The witchers Tarika looked at all stared into her eyes, unafraid. They had never met this woman in their lives. Look closely, Tarika. Aukas smiled at her. He thought it was a friendly smile, but Tarika shivered. She thought a beast was glaring at her. Make sure your verdict is correct. Do not make any mistakes. We don't want to live our lives branded by a crime we never did. Remember your oath. One word of lie, and the burning hells will be your resting place. Silence, a guard roared. You dare threaten the witness before the crowd? They be nervous, some people jeered. Aukas snickered. Is the butcher among them, child? Do not let anyone slip. Cyrus had a foreboding feeling welling within his soul. Tarika's expression was turning downtrodden, 
beads of sweat forming on her forehead. No. Tarika looked away from Kion and Aiden, the only cats among the group. She looked disappointed. Brun of the cat school is not among them. Are you positively sure about that? Cyrus's face turned the color of clouds. He clenched his crutch tighter, his knuckles white. The guards did not look happy either. I swear to the eternal fire, I could recognize that monster anywhere. Tarika pursed her lips. He's not among them. I cannot lie. Not when the gods are bearing witness. Cyrus closed his eyes, disappointed. The bard near the plaza heard everything, and he happily played a tune. He spun around, almost starting to dance. Told you we weren't making things up. The witchers are innocent. They deserve to have odes written for them. Cyrus slammed his crutch down. Through ragged breaths, he roared, Too early for that, bard. They've only proven they didn't wipe out Sweetwater. That's not the only crime they have to disprove. There's also the children. Cyrus looked at the witchers, his eyes blazing with fury. Why'd you come alone? Where are the children? We must hear their testimony. They must confess that they've never been abused or forced to be your test subjects. Test subjects? That's the most ridiculous crockpot theory I've heard. Carl approached the hierarch, his head held high. A few of the younger ladies were swooning because of him. Let me tell you this, Cyrus. Nobody forced us. Carl turned around and spoke to the crowd. We lost our parents. We lost our homes. We had to fight for scraps when this city treated us like dirt. The witchers took us in, taught us how to fend for ourselves. We chose to be part of their order. The other kids stepped ahead and stood with their brother, staring at the crowd. With their hearts soaring, they told their stories. We wish for more children to find a home among us. There are no evil experiments, lies, all of them. They turned to the veteran witchers, their eyes filled with gratitude and worship. They are our teachers, our family. They're the ones who took us in when nobody wanted us. The crowd was shaken by the children's ardent support for the witchers. They knew the kids must have gone through unimaginable horrors for them to take witchers as their family instead of regular humans. Cyrus was unfazed. In fact, his fury dove deep into the freezing ends of hatred. They are beyond saving. They must die. They must be sacrificed for the good of the eternal fire. Look at them. They have a beast's eyes. The experiments have taken over their minds. Standing with the witchers is like standing up for themselves. We cannot trust them, someone shouted. Show us all the children, all fifty-three of them. They're the only ones who can prove your innocence. A slight buzz hurtled through the air, and Roy disappeared. And then a man's howl pierced the crowd as a silhouette was sent flying across the row of guards. The man fell into the plaza, curled up like a cooked shrimp. His gut felt like it was slammed by a sledgehammer. The man was burly, mustached, and donned in brown, grimy leather armor. He was a mercenary. One of the guards barked, How dare you harm an innocent citizen witcher? You are in the presence of the eternal fire. See, ace this at once. The guard swung his blade, pushing the crowd away and making his way to Roy. Something moved. Before anyone could see what took place, the guard's blade fell to the ground, and he staggered backward, shoved by a great force. He retreated into the defensive line of his comrades, his face white with fury. The guard tried to curse the Witcher, but he was met with a pair of beastly, furious eyes. The air around the Witcher tensed up, the guard could feel a terrifying aura swirling around him, and then something worse happened. The remaining witchers glared at the guard, their eyes filled with a raging storm. The air itself felt suffocating, as if the desire to murder had taken the form of a crimson wave, threatening to swallow those who stood before it. Not a single guard had the courage to take even a step ahead. Cyrus himself shut up, his heart thumping furiously. Something flickered in his eyes, and he slowly retreated. Got you, scum. Had fun riling up the people? Let's see if you still find this fun. Roy approached the mercenary and slapped him with enough force to swell his cheek. He then held the mercenary up by the nape, as though he were a puppy. He swung the man in front of the crowd, but the mercenary could not move a muscle. Hear my words, citizens. I shall bring this fiasco to an end. I swear to the gods that everything you see and hear is a conspiracy orchestrated by this man and his employers. They've played you like a fiddle and turned you against us all for their nefarious ends. 
Some of the more rational citizens took Roy's defense into account and mused over the whole affair. They realized that the whole thing seemed too much to be a coincidence. Tell them the truth. Roy cast a sign. The mercenary trembled, and he spoke. It's curls. The witcher's slander was his order. Do not use your spells, witcher. Show us the children if you dare, someone else demanded brazenly, but their attacks were nothing more than a whimper. Roy said, Oh, you'll see them. After this guy tells the truth. The mutants killed someone. A scream tore through the air. Chaos swooped in, and screams came from everywhere in the plaza, cutting Roy's interrogation short. The witchers looked grim. They crouched a little, but had their hands on the hilts of their swords. Crossbow bolts hurtled through the air. An unlucky guard standing beside Cyrus and the mercenary Roy was holding had their heads shot through. They fell headfirst, their bodies limp. Shiru sneered and put his hand crossbow down. He and his companions slithered back into the crowd. Mission accomplished. All that's left is for the other side to do their job. A group of feral elven archers with bushy squirrel tails tied around their waists squeezed through the buffeting throng, approaching the witchers. The witchers attacked the hierarch. They've gone mad. By the gods! The eternal fire has fallen! Gasps and shouts echoed through the air, and any semblance of order was torn down swiftly as the crowd on the fringe stampeded their way to the bridge on the south side. The citizens jostled and pushed and stepped on each other all around the halls and plaza, and screams of bloody murder filled the air. The guards, per their training, went into formation and covered Cyrus, all the while making their retreat into the main hall. Grim held his sword before him like a shield, covering for the escaping crowd. Kahir pulled the infatuated lady behind him into his embrace. Cleaver and his troop of dwarves huddled close and stood their ground like an oak tree facing the pummeling waves of the great seas. Tighten the lines, Letho shouted. He spun his wrist, and his blade arced like a white flash, deflecting a crossbow bolt. Nine witchers stood around him in a circle, covered in the protective light of Quen. They kept the Doppler and the fledgling witchers in the center of their circle, standing tall like a beacon in the darkness. The panicking crowd crashed into them, but they allowed them no entry. Untie me, Gigi shouted. I can help. Carl swung his blade and cut off the ropes, then he took off the cuffs and fetters. Colorful lights strobed from within the Doppler, and he grew into a bald, burly man. A carbon copy of Letho was born. More than a handful of citizens were toppled and stepped to death from the stampede, and their cries hurtled across the battlefield. Within this stampeding crowd, a group of people were traveling against the current, slowly making their way to the center. A burly elf donning a bandana and green cape stood among the crowd, pulling his bowstring back to the side of his ear, his eyes trained on his target. And he let the arrow fly loose. The black-haired witcher stood tall within the crowd. He flicked his wrist and cut the arrow in half. Then he locked eyes with the elven archer. The sword in his hand was switched out for a hand crossbow, and before the elf could even run, he fell backward, his body limp. And he was swallowed by the escaping citizens. Karaka killed, EXP plus 20, level 13 Witcher, 2520 and a 14500. Roy pulled the trigger again, and a white-haired elven swordsman let out a blood-curdling howl as he flew backward from the sheer impact of the bolt, and he fell with a sickening thud. Most of the citizens had escaped, leaving the Eternal Fire's guards and the witchers in the battlefield. Nearby, a group of elven fighters and archers charged into the battlefield, howling war cries into the air. They swung their weapons as they surrounded the witchers, giving them no reprieve nor escape. The guards who'd snapped out of the initial confusion attacked the witchers from behind as well. The witchers were facing off an army that numbered more than 300 strong, Kill the mutants. They've assaulted innocent citizens and our fellow guards. The devout guards charged into battle, fueled with rage and hatred and reckless abandon. The witchers were surrounded by enemies on all sides, and all they saw were hate-filled eyes and deadly flashes of swinging blades. Are you blind, you fools? Lambert spun and smacked the cheek of a black-armored guard, knocking him out. He swung his blade around and blocked a mace that was about to smash his head in. Through the cracks of the clashing weapons, he glared at the young guard before him. 
The damn elves are the enemies here, he cursed. Kill the mutants. Leave no survivors, a wizened, imperious voice ordered from within the guards. Cyrus held his crutch, staring at the witchers like how we would look at ants. They must not be spared. I will never bow to these filthy mutants. This chaos is on their heads. Their deaths will be the fuel for the eternal fire to spread further into the continent. This is its will. The witchers came to a silent understanding. They too had their souls dyed red with fury, their eyes glinting with anger. Leave no survivors, said Roy. He charged into the melee with his blade in hand. Kill them all. The witchers roared into the high heavens, even the youngest of them. They were comrades, teachers, students, and brothers in arm. The witchers held up their blades and charged into the battlefield without any hesitation. And thus, a great battle began. Driven by rage and murder, the witchers broke free of the fetters of rules, law, and neutrality. Here and now, for this moment, they were but machines made to kill. The only thing they yearned for was the life of the enemy. Geralt leapt through the battlefield like a graceful dancer, his blade fluttering to the rhythm its master was playing. With every swing, a guard would fall dead on the ground. Aukas thrust his blade and skewered two enemies in one go. He pulled his weapon out and leapt into the air, then he brought his blade down like a meteor. A bloody line parted an elf in two. The youngest witchers were like wolves trying to take down a lion. They exploited every opening in the melee, dashing and swerving and running around, slamming their weapons into the vitals of the enemy. This would be their first killing of a human, and they had to think of the enemy as nothing but monsters. The fledglings went for the vitals, the throats, the eyes, the hearts. Again and again they swung, following the instincts gained from their rigorous training. There was nothing in their minds but this battle. This was their debut battle, and the children were performing remarkably. They traveled through the battlefield like a whirlwind of death, dicing the Scoia'tael fighters, drenching the beautiful marble floor in red, blinding red. Keon sliced the armor of an elven warrior open like it was butter. The elf didn't even see his killer's face as he died. Letho jumped into the crowd and crouched, then he slammed his left hand onto the ground. Ard's devastating air current lashed out around him, toppling five guards in one go. Then the viper swung his twin swords, ending the lives of the enemies around him. Cohen conjured up twin signs with both hands, and a stream of fire burst forth from his palms, blossoming like flowers of fire. The griffin almost looked like he was holding a fire whip. Anyone who was foolhardy enough to take a step near him would be licked by the flames. Some tried to get closer, only to end up running and screaming in agony. The Doppler joined the battle as well, though he was almost fighting defensively, only knocking his enemies out instead of killing them. The plaza was draped in the bloody violence of battle. The ground was covered in blood and flesh, the air filled with screams and shouts and swinging weapons. Within the bloody battlefield, the witchers stood in a single file, tearing a hole in the wall of enemies around them, like a lance crushing the defenses of the enemy's forces. Roy was in the vanguard, facing the onslaught without fear. His swordsmanship couldn't be of much use here, so he relied on his instincts to battle. His magical barrier broke in mere moments, and blood splattered everywhere. Fortunately, his brethren stood by his side, watching his back so he could take out the enemies before him. Roy swung Guire around, and everywhere its edge pointed, a crimson crescent moon would charge straight ahead, shredding the flesh of all enemies standing before it. Chapter 552, Melee, and then sounds of breaking glass slid into the air as the guards and Scoia'tael members hurled their stock of Dimeritium bombs into the fray. Glimmering dust snaked and spread throughout the battlefield, and the protective light upon the witcher's skin was quelled. From the corners of the plaza, sickly pale elves appeared. Layers of leather belts hung from their necks, their capes and pointy hats billowing in the wind. In their hands were wooden staves with engravings of leaves and flowers. These elves conjured complex gestures and chanted magical incantations under their breaths. A spell was unleashed in the form of a red fireball. It burned like a small sun, crackling the air as it hurtled through the battlefield and slammed into the crowd. A pillar of fire roared into the skies, filling the air with smoke. Debris flew everywhere, 
and a crater left its mark on the ground. Letho, Ocus, and Geralt were in the center of the explosion. Failing to dodge in time, they were thrown into the air and slammed into the army. They knocked out a group of soldiers and rolled around. The explosion didn't tear through the armor reinforced by dragon scales, but it did hurt their innards. Letho and Cohen held their chests as they spewed out blood, then they quickly whipped out a dose of swallow and gulped it down. Carl, Monty, you guys all right? A bloodied serret roared, slicing open the temples of a guard trying to break through their defenses. We're fine. Carl kicked the belly of a hook-nosed elf and pulled his sword out of the corpse's neck. Blood spurted all over his face. No longer was Carl as calm and adorable as he used to be. Veins throbbed all over his visage, contorting his face. His fledgling companions were furious as well. They were fortunate enough to escape the brunt of the explosion, and they huddled around the fallen Cohen, fending off the swarming enemies as best they could. Vesemir, Keon, and the witchers who got away with lighter injuries kept an eye on their companions so they could heal in peace. With their mana sealed by Dimerishim, the witchers were locked out of their signs and magical barriers. They could only rely on their swordsmanship and battle instincts to survive the ordeal. The elven sorceresses did not rest either. They flung and hurled and threw every spell in their arsenal at the witchers, bombarding them with the wrath of the elements. The witchers' advance was brought to a grinding halt. The guards defending Cyrus were trembling in fear. They had never seen any warriors as fearsome as the witchers. In mere minutes, they'd taken down more than fifty guards, demons, all of them. Cyrus held his crutch, staring at the witchers on the battleground, a confident smile curling his lips. They might be formidable, but their numbers are limited. Vilgefortz's reinforcements are here, and so are our guards. They cannot win. As if on cue, an army of guards armed to the teeth came from the southern bridge, swelling the enemy numbers to nearly a thousand. A few were stationed at the port and city gates, and the rest came charging to the battlefield, evacuating the people, and reinstating order however they could. And they attacked the witchers. A minor altar stood in the northern part of the plaza, licked by flames. A gigantic greatsword flew into the air and swung at the elves, cutting them in half. Murder! Someone save me! A pudgy spice merchant screamed. Shut it! The knights are doing their best to keep us safe. A gaunt young man looked at the knights with worship in his eyes. Grim wiped the blood off his face and took back his sword of justice. He stood before the defenseless citizens, fending off the elves that tried to attack them. Kahir kept an eye out for him, taking out any stragglers Grim failed to catch. A while ago, the knights noticed a group of elves clad in old fur armor, snaking around the fringes of the plaza, tossing burning bombs at the citizens and the buildings around them. Everywhere they went, they killed. These elves were agents of Che, Aos, and they were filled with hatred and malice. Hatred for humans. Who are these terrorists? They attacked humans and used the witchers as their scapegoats. To what end do they do this? Cleaver the dwarf stood by the knight, swinging his warhammer up. He leapt into the air and slammed his warhammer into the chin of an oncoming elf, embedding his weapon in his enemy's head. As if hit by a siege weapon, the elf's skull was shattered, and he fell backward, his head a mushy mess. Cleaver's hair swayed, his eyes wide as saucepans. He saw the crimson squirrel tail on the elf's waist, and his face went stern. He muttered, Skoyatel? Thought the bastards were hiding in Dal Blathana and Mahakam. Why'd they attack Novigrad? Cleaver looked around, the look on his face dark. The sanctified plaza was a mess of blood and flesh. Flames burned away at the buildings around, tendrils of smoke billowing in the air, blotting out the sun in sight of the people. In the center of the plaza stood countless guards and Skoya tail members, attacking the witchers like hyenas trying to tear down a pack of lions. At this rate, they would chip away at the witchers and eventually take them down. Roy held Gorer before him and sliced at an incoming fireball. The stars on his blade shone, and something cut the fireball in half. The residual impact was absorbed by his armor, and the attack only managed to singe off a few strands of his hair. Stay here. I'll deal with the sorcerers. Roy gnashed his teeth and looked around. The witchers were rooted to their spots, 
buffeted by the fearless guards and elves and their relentless attacks. With their mana locked away, the witchers had nothing to shield themselves with. They were covered in wounds, their breathing was ragged, and it was all they could do to fend for themselves while slowly chipping away at the enemy, but for every fallen soldier, two more took their place. I'm coming with you, kid. No, you're staying here. Roy spat a cork out of his mouth and gulped another decoction. Black veins throbbed and spread from his chin, and he switched his blade out for Gabriel. The witcher pulled the trigger, and a bolt flew through the air, eventually slamming into an elven sorcerer before he could toss out another fireball. The magical barrier around him popped like a bubble, and horror flickered on his pallid face. He did not expect Roy's bolt to pack this much of a punch. It would take at least three bolts to break through his barrier, or at least that was the case for regular crossbowmen. The sorcerer sidled away, and not a moment too soon either. Another bolt landed in the very spot he stood in earlier, its force chipping off a corner of the marble wall behind. The black-haired witcher charged ahead like the wind, the image of a great, terrible dragon appearing behind him, tearing and clawing away at the soldiers standing in its way, smacking them off the path. The witcher was closing in on the sorcerer at a blistering speed, all the while pulling triggers and tossing a dimerician bomb at the sorcerer. The bomb broke into shards, but the elven sorcerer jerked toward the pillar of the church's hall, hiding behind it in a bid to escape the anti-magic dust. He waved his left hand and shot out a purple electric bolt. The air crackled, and the bolt charred the ground between him and the witcher. The air was filled with blinding light for a split second, and the moment the bolt touched Roy, he exerted every ounce of his strength to jerk away. The arc of electricity grazed his left shoulder, shop, and a great tendril of white smoke billowed from his armor. The skin of his arm was charred, and Roy stopped in his tracks, wobbling like a drunken man, his face contorted in pain. But eventually, he came to the sorcerer. The sorcerer's eyes glinted with icy resolve. He would take Roy down with him, even if it was the last thing he did. He held his left palm before his chest and quickly made a complex hand gesture. The sorcerer chanted something under his breath, then he shoved his hand at the witch, air. An invisible force of magic hit Roy squarely in the chest, and he was blown back. But even though he was flying through the air helplessly, the witcher still pulled his trigger. The sorcerer thought he was safe behind the pillar, but that bolt was far more powerful than the ones that came previously. It pierced the pillar, the barrier, and the sorcerer's skull. A bloody hole bore through the forehead of the elven sorcerer, and he fell backward, his face frozen. Roy rolled around and neutralized the impact of the sorcerer's final spell. Then he sprang back up to his feet, his body so much lighter than before. His mana was no longer locked. If it is death you seek, then death is what you shall get. Roy gnashed his teeth. Come forth, Leviathan. A thunderous rumbling exploded across the plaza, and a great shadow loomed over the smoking battlefield. In came a giant with mountainous muscles and a crude canvas jacket. Leviathan was holding an oak tree in his right hand, and he slammed it into his left as he let out a roar, his eyes gleaming with excitement. Kill again! Kill everyone! Another roar was let loose, and everyone in the battlefield froze. The ice giant leapt high into the air and landed in the south, facing off the guards trying to barge into the plaza. He swung his oak tree and sent countless guards flying through the air. They fell with a horrifying thud, their limbs broken, their chests caved in. They were an inch away from death, moans and groans of agony swimming in the air. By the gods! The citizens ran away frantically. Is this a sign of the end of days? A man cried in fear. The braziers of the halls shone upon the guards hiding within. One of the younger ones stared at the ice giant, Agape. What in the name of eternal fire is that? Could that be, could that be divine retribution? His companion was in disbelief as well, his hands shaking, his blade almost falling. But why'd the gods punish us instead of the evil witchers? Cyrus looked scandalized, and he quickly whirled around. No, this is another trick of the witchers. Kill that evil creature. We have the numbers. And then hundreds of bolts flew toward the giant, trying to pierce it, but all were deflected by the giant's hard skin. 
Dozens of armored knights rode across the bridge, charging at the giant with their lances and weapons held high. Despite their best efforts, the giant squashed them into mincemeat easily. Leviathan's strength and defense were to be reckoned with. Before him, humans were nothing but weaklings. Weaklings that could be taken out easily. With Leviathan joining the fray, a huge weight was lifted off the besieged witchers. Must be Roy. Geralt was revitalized. He spun around and sliced the neck of a Scoia'tael member open, blood drenching his hair. I am not surprised, given that he tamed a griffin. Letho swung his blades and cut down a pair of guards. Now let's kill these bastards, people. Let's go. Carl and the young witchers roared. A breath of second wind was injected into the witchers, their morale boosted once more. Their attacks were swifter and deadlier, clearing the attacking army around them with lethal accuracy. Leviathan distracted most of the enemies, and without their reinforcements joining in a timely manner, their line of defense was torn open. Like an unstoppable wave, the witchers crashed upon the guards and Scoia'tael members, crushing their bodies underneath their onslaught. Blood splattered everywhere, but then it was vaporized as soon as it was drawn. The witchers roared as they cut open a bloody path to the main hall of the church. A white flash of light shot through the air, heading toward the northeastern part of the church. An elven sorceress in green robes was making a great fireball, but then her magical barrier broke without a hint. She felt the crimson silhouette of death looming over her, and a scream escaped her lips. Then she rippled and disappeared like an illusion, reappearing ten yards away in the next moment. She thought she had escaped D, D, death, and she heaved a sigh of relief, holding her staff tightly. But then the air before her shattered, and she felt the metal of a sword held to her cheek. A crouched silhouette came out of the portal before her, crimson tentacles dancing behind him. Murder flared brightly in his eyes, but it was cold, freezing. The witcher's frigid gaze turned her soul to ice, and she couldn't even lift a finger. You shall die. Another white flash arced through the air, and the elf's head flew high up into the sky. Two down, three to go. The remaining sorcerers knew someone was out to get them. If they didn't band together fast enough, the assassin would destroy them all eventually. Quickly, they made their way to the antechamber in the east, their cloaks billowing in the air, their steps quick as the wind. Still, their magic was no match for the speed of Roy's bolts. A handsome sorcerer turned his head around in his escape, and his eyes went wide. The release of the bolt was the elves' death knell. He saw the magical barrier of his comrade burst into pieces, and then a crimson octopus leapt from the air behind him and grabbed the elf with its tentacles and wrapped him up until he was a cocoon. It held the cocoon high up in the air, and the witcher appeared behind it mysteriously. He was holding an ivory blade with both hands, and he thrust the blade ahead. The tentacles slowly moved away, revealing the elf within. The blade skewered him like he was meat, and blood frothed at his mouth. His eyes were wide, and whimpers of pain gurgled weakly from his lips. Roy held him high up in the air, as though he were offering a sacrifice to an evil god. He humphed and pulled his blade out of the corpse, then he flicked the blood off its edge. The witcher locked on to an elven sorceress, his desire to murder freezing her soul, and then a few silhouettes appeared behind the sorceress, the magic radiating from them almost lighting the air ablaze. Sorcerers, Roy scanned all of them, and he stopped at two of those he recognized. He had no idea who the elves were, but the humans he knew. One was in the attire of a mercenary. He was in hunting gear, making it easy for him to move. His eyes were black and glistening. His lips were razor thin, and a scar hung from his cheek. The man was holding a short knife against the neck of his hostage, a man tied up beside him. The knife had made a small cut, drawing blood. Rience had taken Goin hostage, and the Doppler was blinking furiously at the Witcher, pleading for him to leave. Standing with Rience was a sorceress in a clean blue dress. She was a gaunt lady who radiated the air of an intellectual. There was a hint of sorrow in her silence, and Roy almost felt like she should have been an artist instead of a sorceress. She was far removed from this battle. Her cheeks were bizarrely stiff and almost uncanny. Lights of magic strobed upon her skin. She could see the Witcher sizing her up, and her eyes were filled with displeasure. Lydia Van Bredevoort and Ryans. 
Vilgefortz's most trusted lieutenants. Finally, these snakes are making their entrance. Roy knew the true battle was about to begin, and he moved behind the pillar. Don't move, or my hand might slip. Don't want to get your friend hurt, do you? Rience heaved a sigh of relief and stopped the elves from throwing their spells. The elves glared at the witcher venomously, but they followed their orders. Francesca specifically told them to listen to Rience. And a conversation began. You're far stronger than I expected. Not even an army could take you guys down, and they lost a ton of them in the process. The church is going to find its reputation damaged significantly. And you, you possess the power to traverse space. A lowly witcher like you, possessing a power not even my master has, and he is the world's greatest sorcerer, and to think you also have control over that ice giant. Rience clicked his tongue, part of it sarcasm, part of it compliments. You are a respectable rival. Rience gazed at him. It'd be a waste to kill you just because of your momentary ignorance. You have two options. One, surrender and give us that gray-haired girl. You know who I'm talking about and I shall generously forgive your offensive behavior. I shall take you to my master, and you can swear fealty to him. That'll bring this fiasco to an end. Rience proudly said, My master is a powerful man. He can help you witchers gain a better footing in society. No longer will you be treated like scum. No longer will the people try to chase you out. If he's feeling generous, you shall come to possess a plot of land for yourself. A land where witchers could build their kingdom. Rience smiled, almost alluringly. But if you wish to continue with your futile efforts at resistance. He turned around and looked at the church. Leviathan and the army of the church were in a stalemate, but the ice giant was slowly having his stamina drained. The unrelenting attack had made its mark, covering the giant with wounds. Even its swings were getting sluggish. The witchers were engaged in battle with a group of guards before the entrance of the church. The guards were Cyrus's last line of defense. Then the collector shall die, and soon, so shall your comrades, Raspoli. Even if a few of them manage to escape, there will be no place in this world you can call home. The armies of all kingdoms will chase you to the ends of this world. Roy kept his silence, holding his blade tightly. His eyes were glinting. He must meet Vilgefortz and make him pay for everything he did. Worried about your precious orphanage? Rience smiled brightly. Don't worry, friend. My comrades are on their way to take care of the matter. The children should be all asleep by now. Don't waste my time and give me your answer. Chapter 553 In the Forest The trees rustled as they were buffeted by the wind. The scent of smoke and heat slowly seeped into the air, and lights of flames dotted the landscape. The trees, leaves, vines, and all greenery in the woods were burning, and bodies were strewn all across the woods clearing. Bodies of elves in cheap clothes and squirrel tails hanging around their waists. Bodies of human mercenaries clad in grimy armor. Some had their legs crushed by gigantic bear traps, their flesh torn to shreds, their bones exposed to the elements. They fell to the ground, holding their mangled legs in agony. Some were slammed by logs that swung out of nowhere, and they fell, their innards crushed. Their chests caved in, and they coughed up blood. Some had their feet grabbed by hidden ropes, and they dangled with their head upside down. Some were swallowed by the holes in the ground and skewered by the lethal stakes buried underneath. Even though they'd lost a few fighters before they even saw the enemy, the ragtag group made out of Scoia'tael members and mercenaries pushed on relentlessly. Craven rats. Shiru broke into a small run, his ponytail swinging like a rotten branch. He rasped, once we get the witchers, I'll torture them myself, they must pay for the murders they committed. As if on cue, the elves behind him were riled up, their faces contorted with rage. An eyebrowless, ghoulishly skeletal man sneered. Let me do it, I know how to hit them the hardest. It'll be an unforgettable experience for them. You can hear them scream, free of charge, of course. The man held the witcher medallions hanging before his neck tightly. You'll see how wonderful their screams are. Behind them was an elf with an abnormally high nose bridge. He growled quietly, Something's there. Look out. They were met with a greenhouse, and a layer of fog was draped around it. Refreshing scent of the plants invigorated the elves of Dalblathana. Captivated, they took a closer look, 
and saw more than 40 types of plants living within the greenhouse. Celandine, crow's eye, sage, and plants they'd never seen before were housed here, thriving and growing. Not even the Blue Mountains had a greenhouse with this kind of diversity. The fog surrounding the greenhouse seemed to have a life of its own. It swirled and thickened, blocking the invader's line of sight, and then two burly beings appeared from within the fog. They charged ahead at terrifying speeds, the ground beneath shaking with every step the beings took. Leaves fell like rain, and sounds of cracking branches echoed from the ferns. The invaders stood back to back, pulling their bowstrings and whipping their weapons out. What in blazes is that? Shiru's eyes went wide, and he took a deep breath. Leo saw the creatures as well, and his beard shivered, his eyes flaring with excitement. Look out! The ground rumbled, and finally, the invaders got a good look at the creatures. They resembled a pair of oak trees with rough bark and numerous burls, but unlike oaks, which were usually docile and unmoving, these creatures were running around like lumbering elephants, swinging their arms wildly. Despite their size, they were fast, and in mere moments, they crashed into the invaders' assault squad. Everyone turned the color of clouds. Attack! Shiru bellowed. Even without his orders, the invaders were already letting their arrows loose, the projectiles whizzing through the air. They fell upon the creatures, but they swung their arms and swatted 99 out of 100 arrows away. The remaining arrows couldn't even puncture the creatures' bark deeply. All they did was draw a few drops of milky white blood, but the creatures charged ahead, unfazed by the pain. They swung their arms and captured two of the invaders like cockerels hunting for centipedes and worms. The unlucky invaders found themselves wrapped by branches and held in the air. They wriggled and shimmied like snakes trying to escape their captors, and their screams haunted the hearts of their comrades. That was not enough to scare the invaders, however. They swung their blades away at the trance like they were gardeners trying to trim their yard's bushes. A moment later, the trance were already covered in bruises and wounds. Still, they were stronger than any oak, and these invaders had no experience dealing with these creatures before. Despite their efforts, they couldn't even cut off the entirety of the Trent's arms. While they were attacking, the Trent's had already wrapped up a few more of the invaders, and in mere moments, there was already a row of soldiers hanging from their branches. Like boa constrictors, the branches were tightening their chokehold. Panicked, the invaders flailed their legs, but it was to no avail. Eventually, their eyes bulged, their tongues lolled, and their beards were drenched with their blood and vomit as they were suffocated to their deaths. Interesting. Within the howls came the excited shout of a certain ghoulish bounty hunter. He laughed and spat at his runic sword. Come, tree, let us dance. He pounced at the treant on the left, swift as a hare and quiet as a cat. The Trent was suffocating a yellow-haired elf to his death, and it only spared one branch to fend this invader off. Leo swung his blade down at the branch, and the clash sounded as if two pieces of metal were slammed together. Most metals couldn't do anything to the branches, but Leo's sword was different, and he had strength and speed that far surpassed any regular man. He sliced the monster's arm with ease, and the broken arm wriggled like a snake for a moment, then it went still. The bounty hunter closed in on the trant, and a dozen branches lashed out at him. Like a spinning top, the bounty hunter spun around. The whirlwind of death sliced off the branches, and they fell like corpses. Like a billy goat leaping across steep cliffs, he jumped around the battlefield, positioning and repositioning himself to avoid every single attack the trant threw at him. He did not suffer a single injury. The other invaders saw nothing but a curtain of shimmering metal dancing around the trant, gouging its skin and drawing blood. A few minutes later, milky-white blood oozed from the burl that looked like the trant's eye, and Leo pulled his blade out. The trant shivered for a moment, and it went still. It stood like a dead oak tree. That was fun! Leo spun his blade and went to the other trant. Evelyn was standing in the greenhouse, dressed in a green dress made of tree bark, her hair tumbling down her shoulders, a mistletoe garland crowned atop her head. A wooden staff was strapped to her back, swaying with every step she took. Green lights strobed upon her as she put out the fires erupting across the woods. She then pulled back her magic and frowned. 
The Guardian has returned to nature? A mortal killed it? Evelyn found this unbelievable. A storm raged in her eyes, her fury icy enough to freeze the land. Green light burst forth from the woods like waves, and the ground rumbled, the air shaken with deafening roars. Beasts of every shape and size charged from their hiding spots, their fangs bared, their eyes filled with cold-blooded murder. The invaders found themselves surrounded by beasts of all manners. Weasels, rats, vipers, lynxes, and even boars. They came by droves and charged at the invaders, ripping them into shreds. The invaders were shaken to the core. Before they could stage a counterattack, the beasts had already attacked them, and the air was filled with a cacophony of roars and swinging weapons. They have a druid on their side. Damn it all! Shiru roared and sliced an attacking weasel in half. The invaders were scrambling to defend themselves. This was but the first bout of onslaught, and already there were people killed by the boards. But the smaller critters were the real trouble. The rats and vipers slithered and scurried everywhere, attacking the invaders where they least expected it. Spiders and lizards jumped down from the trees, sliding into the invaders' clothes and calm how pet away at their soft spots. A burly invader's eyes bulged, and he howled in pain, holding his crotch. He jumped around in pain, his cheeks purple. And then he rolled on the ground, his pants slowly turning crimson. The sight of the man sent chills down his comrade's spines. A freckled elf pierced a rabid dog's throat, but before he could do anything else, a lynx leapt through the air and sliced the elf's throat open, its claws glinting coldly. The elf's windpipe was slashed in two, and he fell with a thud. A large group of mice held him up and scurried off deep into the woods like they were carrying a broken siege weapon. The boars and wolves were working together, whittling down the number of enemies. And to make things worse, a terrible creature that was the amalgamation of a lion and eagle doved from the skies, a great air current lashing out at the invaders. It caught an invader between its talons and took him high up into the air. Moments later, crimson rain fell upon the battlefield, and a mangled corpse slammed into the ground. They have a griffin. The witchers have a griffin. A muscular invader with a narrow forehead shouted in terror, and he fired at the skies, but all his arrows either missed or were deflected by the griffin's wings. Moments later, the griffin flew back down and took with it another invader, sentencing him to his death. Roars and cries and screams and the swinging of metal filled the air of the woods. The invaders were fending off the beasts, but every time the invaders killed a beast, three more would take its place. Eventually, the green of the woods was drenched with the blood of the dead. Damn these beasts! Get the firebombs! We'll burn them to cinders! Shiru roared. The invaders quickly took the oil jars from their utility belts and pelted them at the incoming beasts. A great pillar of flames charged into the skies, illuminating the snarling invaders. The beast's onslaught was stopped, cut off by the flames. The air crackled and sizzled, the aroma of burning flesh undulating across the battlefield. Burning beasts ran and pranced around, bumping into their companions, spreading the fire further. The beast's attack slowed, and Leo pulled his blade out of the second Trent's eye, killing it. He swung away at an incoming boar, slicing it in half. Blood drenched his face, and a sneer twisted his lips. Who shall be my next partner, I wonder? A round glass container shattered into shards, and the explosion sent more than five invaders flying away, burning like a pyre. Sparks flew in every direction, and the flames spread faster than the screams of the invaders could. Behind the army of beasts stood a mousy, balding man in grimy robes. He held up a special firebomb, a smirk curling his lips, and he blinked, the dark circles under his eyes sagging. Regular firebombs are bland. Kalkstein invited sinisterly. Why don't you have a taste of my custom bomb? It's an all-you-can-eat buffet. Another bomb was set off, but this time, a cloud of freezing vapor lashed out at the invaders, turning the closest pair of invaders into icy sculptures. On the other side of the beast army was a woman in long black robes, and a ball of ice swirled within her palms. Her robes billowed despite the lack of winds, and they clung tightly to her perfect curves. Sunlight shone upon her beautiful visage, her crimson hair billowing in the air, but her eyes were cold as ice. She was like a goddess, holding the power of the whole winter in her hands. They have a druid, a griffin, and two sorcerers guarding this place? 
damn the witchers. We're in deep. Shiru snarled, fear flickering in his eyes. The invaders were slammed into disarray. Shiru tried to fire at the sorcerer, but he quickly jerked away and behind a tree and cackled maniacally as an exploding dimerician bomb missed him. At the same time, the sorceress disappeared into thin air. The sorcerers flickered in and out of the battlefield, shielding themselves behind trees and escaping with their spells whenever the Brunen why had to. The invaders would find themselves bombarded by their spells from time to time. That ain't the only trouble here. Leo dragged his blade across the ground and walked past the group of invaders, making his way to the other side of the battlefield. Within the fog and fire stood two silhouettes, and in their hands were swords. One was burly and equipped with a pair of spiked spalders. The medallion of a wolf's head hung around his neck, and a scar spanned the right side of his face. His gaze was filled with ice-cold fury, his face deadpan. The witcher held his sword high above his shoulder, slowly closing in on Leo, preparing to charge into battle. The other witcher had a pair of sunglasses hanging from his nose. He was gaunt, and he donned Cat School's light armor. Hanging around his neck was the medallion of a cat's head. His steps were light and fast, and his razor-thin blade swung around. The look in his eyes was as cold as his companions. They walked together, taking big strides toward the crowd, and they met the gaze of Leo, the bounty hunter with dead eyes, and sparks flew. Adrenaline pumped through Leo's veins, and he shivered uncontrollably. This would be his first time facing off two witchers at once. It would prove to be his deadliest battle to date, but it would also be the peak of his career. Come, witchers, swing your blade, dance with me. This is a party for three. Leo roared at his adversaries and beckoned at them, his eyes glinting darkly. Two on one, this shall be a never-before-seen performance, and heads will roll. Not mine, though. Before you draw your last breath, I shall grant you the last ever joy you'll taste. Leo drew a line across the ground as he held his blade up. He thrust his left hand forward and charged toward the Witcher, fast as a phantom. The leaves behind him flew high into the air. The tune begins. Dimerishim bombs were tossed, and the Witchers found their mana restricted. Felix and Eskel could have dodged that, but out of their pride as swordsmen, they took the hit head-on. This would be a duel with swords. The shrill shriek of metal clashing ripped the air as the Witchers flanked the human arrogant enough to take them on at once. Leo didn't retreat, however. He leapt ahead and jumped through the crack between the Witcher's attack. The blade cut open his armor, but in exchange, he managed to land behind his adversaries. The bounty hunter whirled and lashed out twice, his blade flashing like comets streaking through the skies. The first attack cut Felix's shoulder open, and the second hit Eskel's left rib. Blood spurted and the witchers grunted, but they did not stop or slow down. One whirled and swung his blade down at Leo's nape, while the other crouched and thrust his blade at Leo's chest. Metal pierced the air, hissing like snakes. Leo rolled backward and dodged the attacks. Before the witchers could launch another attack, Leo fought back, swinging his blade again and again. Metal clashed and sparks flew around, creating a mini waterfall made of fire. It shone brighter than any flames dancing in the woods. Shiru pierced the head of a lynx with his sword and stopped it cold in its jump, but he was drenched with sweat, with not a smile on his face. Flames and icicles were raining down around him, his companions howling in agony. They were two hundred strong when they started this mission, but not even five minutes later, they lost more than half of that, and their numbers were still dwindling at a worrisome speed. The forest grounds were now a hellscape of blood and cadavers. As if the sorcerers and griffins were not trouble enough, the druid decided to join the fray. She turned the invaders into cinders with her lightning bolts, sending them flying with her hurricanes only for them to fall back down and break their limbs. The beasts seemed to be endless, and they swarmed the invaders, keeping them away from the spellcasters. Most of the arrows and dimerician bombs couldn't hurt them. They easily dodged those using their home advantage, e. The sparse arrows that hit them failed to break through their magical barriers. Shiru felt powerless. He might end up letting Vilgeforts down. If we can't even take down the Witcher's companions, their main team in Novigrad must be shaking the city itself. Shiru stared at the clearing, despair welling in his eyes. 
a trio of silhouettes were clashing and breaking apart at blinding speeds, sparks flying everywhere. The fighters had strength and speed that outstripped regular humans, and their swordsmanship was on a level of its own. Shiru couldn't even see how they moved or fought. All he could make out was the sweat and blood that poured to the ground with every clash, and the crimson sparks of blood. Thirty seconds later, a shrill hum of a swinging blade brought the battle to an end. The witchers and Leo separated for one last time. Leo was hunched over, barely holding himself up with his sword as a crutch. His armor was tattered, his body covered in horrifying wounds. He was worn out, his snow-white beard covered in blood, and he stared at his adversaries with bloodshot eyes, but there was a satisfied smile on his lips. A bloodied Eskel grunted and fell ahead on his knees. A gust of icy gale sprinted through the woods, and a gash opened up the witcher's neck. Blood poured forth like a fountain, and Eskel fell to the ground, his life slowly ebbing away. He saw flashes of his life playing in his head, scenes of his early life as an orphan, nightmares of the experiment, then memories of his time with his brethren. All the dull moments, triumphs, and deadly battles ran through his head, ending with memories of the brotherhood and his time with the succubus. My brothers, children, Pashia, I'm sorry. Eskel's pupils started dilating and his consciousness was fading to black. A wounded Felix spat out a wooden cork and gulped down a dose of swallow, then he held up Eskel's body, his chest drenched with his blood. The cat could feel his companion's breathing slow down. It's your lucky day, mate. He whipped out a prized possession he'd been holding on for quite a while now. Felix intended for Carl to use it, but he passed the trial without a hitch. Lucky him. Since then, he'd kept this item on him. Leo roared with laughter. Ain't had this much fun in a while. Witchers really are the best dance partners. Twice the fun if there's two of ya. Been a real blast. He grabbed the medallions before his neck and tore them off. Then he tossed them at the witchers. Take this. It's your reward. His dark, raspy voice was drowned out by the roars of battle, but his smile remained. I've been waiting for this day. Dying in battle is a lot better than dying in bed, be it because of sickness or anything else, better than getting feasted on by maggots. He turned to the body of Eskel, and now I have my wish, one for one, ain't too bad. He looked at the fallen Eskel, his eyes flaring with battle spirit. We're resuming this battle when we meet in hell, ain't gonna be a lonely trip with a battle partner with me. I have no regrets. The ghost of Leo's smile was etched on his face, and death claimed him. He drew his last breath, still leaning on his blade. The gash on his lower back cut deep, his bones exposed to the elements, and blood trickled to the ground. You were a terrifying adversary, Leo, the strongest human I've ever fought. There was praise in Felix's eyes, then he shook his head. But you didn't claim Eskel's life. He popped the acorn into Eskel's mouth. You died for nothing. The acorn slid down Eskel's food tract, and the power of life radiated from his body forming a green cocoon around him. It clung tightly to Eskel's wound, and as if the Witcher had just taken the most brilliant healing potion in the world, the gash on his neck was healing up quickly. Like a snake, he shed his old skin, replacing it with a layer of silky smooth skin. Even his scar was gone. Life swam into Eskel, and his eyes snapped open, shining like two small suns. The flames burst into an explosion, and Shiru felt everything spin, he flew into the skies, heat and agony drowning his mind. Exhaustion overwhelmed him from within, and everything faded into darkness. Sounds, smell, light, everything. His life was snuffed out, and along it, his ambitions. Before he fell to his death, Shiru saw Leo drawing his last breath, their trump card fallen to the clutches of death. We lost. A crushing defeat. Vilgefortz, one last thought crossed his mind before he died. Avenge Us. Chapter 554 begin. The battle at the plaza was coming to an end, though smoke still billowed in the air. Like a great dam in the river, the ice giant barred entry for the hundreds of guards who tried to penetrate his defenses. Still, the guards charged ahead relentlessly, prodding him with their weapons, shooting at him with their arrows, and burning him with their bombs. Even though their attacks did nothing but negligible damage, the accumulation of their insignificant attacks could still wear Leviathan down. Before he knew it, the ice giant was already covered in wounds, his breathing ragged, his ruby eyes dim. 
His oak tree bat was already broken from the countless swings. Leviathan grabbed the stake that Gigi was tied to earlier and spun around like a whirlwind of death, the air crackling. Any guards who tried to even get near the ice giant, even the heavily armored cavalry, was smashed into meat pies. The plaza was covered in blood. While the ice giant was distracting most of the guards, the witchers charged ahead, swinging their swords at anyone who would try to attack them. The guards fell by the droves, unable to match the witchers. The witchers stepped upon the bodies of fallen guards and Skoya tail members, carving a path through the northern part of the plaza. A path won through arduous battles. And finally, they came to the main hall of the church. Letho and Vesemir cut down the guards who foolishly still defended the entrance. Lambert, Aukus, Geralt, and Cohen cast Ard at the same time, and a devastating current of air smashed into the golden doors. The doors yawned open, revealing the great hall behind. Braziers burned in the corners, illuminating the spacious chamber. The ceiling was held up by a few pillars made of gold, and a blazing red carpet unfurled before them, leading to the dais further down the chamber, where Cyrus's throne stood, where a crimson wall overlooked the hall. Cyrus stood with his staff in hand, protected by twenty guards. His robes were sullied by blood, his arrogance replaced by fear, his beard shivering. The old man looked nervous and worn out. Never did he expect this day to come. Fifteen lowly witchers. Fifteen bloodied, wounded witchers with black blood coursing through their veins. They were outnumbered, their potions almost depleted, but despite the disadvantage, these mutants tore down an iron-clad defense line made up of five sorcerers and hundreds of guards. And they did it in Novigrad, the base of the Eternal Fire's operations. They carved a path through the bodies of their enemies and made their way to him, the Hierarch. This was a feat no human could accomplish. Even with the Ice Giant lending them immense help, the Witchers had proved themselves to be far more formidable than he had expected. The Apprentice Witchers closed the Golden Doors. They no longer had the air of children after going through that bloody battle. Their eyes radiated murder and determination, almost like they were full-fledged adults. With Letho in the lead, the bloodied Witchers quickly closed in on the Hierarch. The blood that fell from their armor drenched the carpets in an even deeper shade of red. Gigi trailed behind them, and he felt conflicted seeing his erstwhile superior. He never thought he could escape death and face Cyrus in triumph. For that, he was glad the Witchers were his allies. Rivulets of sweat poured down the guards' faces, their hands shaking uncontrollably, and they prayed in their hearts, the demons, they've arrived. Please, gods, deliver us from evil. Cyrus, you old fool, Lambert mocked loudly, his voice laced with fury. He wiped the blood from his blade with the cloth of his shirt. If you'd tried to coexist in peace, you'd never have this kind of trouble, but no, you just had to. What did you say again? Ah, yes, leave no survivors. Well, wish granted, I think. The witchers glared at Cyrus, livid. Cyrus' heart skipped a beat, his face red with fear. His back was hunched, his beard drenched with foam. This is all a misunderstanding. Someone's try, ing, to turn us on each other. And I fell for their trick. I swear this is a misunderstanding. The eternal fire hasn't spread its flames far enough. I can't die here. At this point, I have to surrender and look for more opportunities. Cyrus took a deep breath. Once this crisis is over, I'll find a way to topple these bastards. Cyrus raised his trembling right hand and swore loudly, in the name of the eternal fire, I swear, if you cease this meaningless massacre at once, then I shall tell the citizens the truth of this chaos. It was the elves. Yes, the elves were the ones who brought this upon us. This is enough, isn't it? I'm bowing to you. Me, the hierarch, the head of all fifty churches in the north. Cease this at once, mutants. Lambert scoffed, and he dragged himself up the stairs. Oath? Your oath means nothing, you reneging scum. Sarit's eyes twinkled. But we don't mind knowing who your partner in crime is, so who's the one you've been working with? Ryance, Cyrus answered without hesitation. Ryance is just a common goon. Vilgeforts might get mad, but at least I still have a chance for a negotiation. And who might Ryance serve? asked Letho, his voice monotonous. Someone started slamming the golden doors, the wooden beam blocking it, shaking tremendously. Cyrus looked reinvigorated. Reinforcements are here. I do not know. Cyrus tried to buy time. He despises witchers, 
and he proposed a partnership. I fell for his tricks, thinking it was a fair deal, but all is still not too late. Please, cease this at once. I'll explain everything to the citizens. You can still build a home in Novigrad, and I promise no one will get in the way of your project. Sorry, but it's too late for that. Vesemir shook his head, a sigh rushing out of his lips. The moment they launched the attack, they knew the consequences that awaited them. Too many people saw their onslaught. Too many guards died by their hands. The influence would spread far and wide. It would not be something easily mitigated nor diminished in a short span of time. The witchers couldn't deny all allegations either. Their home would never know peace for a long time. In response to Cyrus's feeble offer, the witchers unsheathed their weapons and flickered across the halls. Flashes of light drowned Cyrus's guard, and they fell without making a move, blood spurting from their throats, and they rolled down the staircase. Kian grabbed Cyrus by his hair and pressed him down on the cold, hard ground. The old man fell to his knees, too weak to even resist. He knelt before the very creatures he loathed the most. Repent, for the deaths your foolish decision has caused. You've won, witchers? Cyrus's face was red with humiliation. Like a tamed dog, he howled. Please, have mercy. You cannot kill the Eternal Fire's priest before its eyes. This is blasphemy. It will rain down retribution. You're invoking the name of your god? Fury flared within the hearts of the witchers. If his god is nothing but a monster that torments those who only want to live peaceful lives, then that monster deserves no worship. Silence. A carbon copy of Letho took a step ahead, glaring at the once revered and sacred hierarch. He once respected this senile man. Cyrus, under your leadership, numerous commissioners found themselves beguiled and lost to the allure of coin, lust, and power. For their abandonment of the path, you condemned them, claiming that they were not devout enough to resist the temptation of worldly offerings. Gigi hissed, but you're blind to your own pitfalls. You, despite being the hierarch for so many years, are blind to your own corruption. For many years, you've been consumed by your own greed. The power, title, and honor have gone to your head. You would do anything to reach your goal, no matter how nefarious the acts are. You'd twist stories in your favor and condemn innocent souls to death, and you claim it is done for the spread of the fire. That is nothing but an excuse. Excuse to cover up your own avarice. Your actions have brought nothing but the pa, taint of darkness upon the sacred fire. Gigi took a deep breath and turned his gaze to the golden emblem of flames behind the throne. Your actions have consequences, and now they have borne fruit in the form of divine retribution. God hath judged you. Cyrus shivered, his face turning three shades whiter. His conviction that he held on for decades wavered for a moment, and tears streamed down his cheeks as if he had a mental breakdown. Divine retribution? Me. Impossible. I spent my life spreading the glory of the eternal fire. I have given everything to it. For my mission, I've remained celibate. I've refused to sire my own heir, and I have no family to call my own. It cannot punish me. It cannot. Cyrus raised his head and let out an ear-piercing shriek. You Doppler bastard! The witchers exchanged a look and nodded. They gave Cyrus not a moment more, bringing down their sword on his nape. Blood streaked into the air, and the head of Cyrus rolled down the staircase, his face contorted in rage. Cyrus Engelkind Hemelfart was venomous until the very end, but no longer could he do any harm. Letho touched the head, and it disappeared, tucked away in his ring. He then tucked the headless corpse away as well, cleaning up the crime scene. Silence fell upon the hall. Besides the Witcher and the Eternal Fire, no one was privy to the death of the Hierarch. Gigi was surprised. He couldn't understand why the Witchers did that. Letho said, Well, what are you waiting for? I beg your pardon? Gigi was confused. The guards were pummeling the door even harder. He's not the only corrupted official around. There'll be more like him ready to exploit this power vacuum. But do you really want another Cyrus to take the throne of the Hierarch? Vesemir stroked his blood-stained beard. What we're trying to say is, why don't you take up the mantle of Hierarch and lead the Church of the Eternal Fire? No, not just a single church. All the churches in the North. If you're Hierarch, no guards or believers would suspect you of being a Doppler, Lambert suggested adamantly. You can rewrite the rules and lead the church to a better path. They want me to take over as Hierarch? 
Gigi shook his head. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. The door was moments away from being taken down. This is your chance to realize your ambitions, Gigi. Miss it, and you won't have another chance. Geralt patted Gigi's shoulder. Or would you rather suffer the citizen's prejudice and escape like a dog with its tail tucked between its legs, all the while allowing ignorance to rule this city? The witchers stared at Gigi, anticipation filling their eyes. Gigi gritted his teeth, memories of being tied to the stake, slandered by the people, and judged by their ignorance flashing in his head. All his passion and uptight morality was cooled by his frustration, and he sighed. I will not run this time. Light strobed from within the Doppler, and his body contracted and wriggled like a ball of dough getting kneaded into another shape. One moment later, Cyrus reappeared among them, hunched and in blood-stained robes. He stared at his gaunt, gnarled hands, confused for a moment. He then took a deep breath and straightened out the golden crown atop his head, his visage taking on a solemn shade. He then felt the cool of a blade touching his neck. Serret looked at him apologetically. Sorry, but we have to do this if we want to look more credible. Don't forget, it's all the elves' fault, and we'll always be allies. If the witchers came out chatting happily with Cyrus when they were at each other's throats a minute ago, anyone would know that something was off. They had to appear like they were holding Cyrus hostage and ensure their future would be secure. Let's go. Time to bring this fiasco to an end. The doors finally gave in, and they fell. Guards charged into the halls, roaring and swinging their weapons, and then they froze, their blood running cold. The sight they were served with was more shocking than the escape of the ice giant. It was unbell, ivable enough that the giant escaped through the sea, but now they were seeing something worse. The blasted witchers were standing atop a pile of corpses, holding the hierarch hostage while slowly approaching the guards. There was another battle going on in a certain antechamber, and it too was coming to an end. Roy scanned the sorcerers slowly, Ryans, Lydia, and two Scoyatel sorcerers. Tension was running high. Should I kill them all? No, that won't help. The true mastermind is still free. As long as Vilgefortz draws breath, we'll never be at peace. I cannot allow him to live and scheme against us. This is for Siri, for my unexpected child and I cannot forgive him for ruining our hard-earned home. Roy wouldn't stop until he met Vilgefortz and took him out of the picture. He has to pay for his actions. You promise we'll have a plot of land of our own if I shake your hand? Roy held Guire like it was a crutch holding him up. He wiped the blood off his forehead, a gentler air surrounding him. Yes, if you give in willingly. A smile twinkled in Ryance's eyes. I will take you to Vilgefortz, and you shall tell him where Ciri is. Vilgefortz is known for his generosity. Serving him is miles better than working for any king, and you'd better get on it. Rance glanced at the plaza through the corner of his eye. At the end of his wits, the ice giant charged through the defense line and leapt into the sea under the island. The guards charged into the great hall, raring to kill. Hesitate, and your comrades die. Roy had hesitation in his eyes. What are you waiting for? Throw down your weapon. Rance stared at Roy moving his knife around Gawain's neck. Get on your knees and submit. Lydia was deadpan, but the Scoyatel sorcerers looked satisfied. He wants me to kneel? Roy shook his head, smirking, and he stared at the arrogant sorcerer. One little mistake, Rience. I do not take well to threats. Roy pulled the trigger, and a Scoyatel sorcerer was blasted through the air before the enemies could see what was happening. He slammed into the wall of the antechamber and fell limply a big hole bore through his chest. Roy blinked through space and appeared before the corpse. Crimson light strobed, and the other Scoyatail sorcerer was drowned by the tentacles that leapt out of the void. Roy swung his sword and lopped off the enemy's head. Lydia fired a bolt of electricity at the Witcher. The bolt leapt across the ground, but it only hit air. Roy blinked through space again and appeared before Lydia. The bolt he fired smashed her magical barrier and the sorceress arm flew into the air, sliced by the witcher's blade. She grunted, and a burst of green light came forth from within her body. Then she disappeared into thin air. Rience slit Gawain's throat and tossed him away. Then he sent a column of fire flying at Roy, the flames burning up the air and ground. Roy appeared beside the dying Gawain and spun his blade around, cutting the rope 
and cuffs off. His elder blood roared, and the power of time came rushing out of him, enveloping the dying Gawain. Just like that, Gawain's slit neck healed and was good as new. What happened, Roy? Gawain sat up, touching his neck. He looked at Roy, surprised. He vividly remembered Rience slitting his throat, and then he fell into the darkness of death. So how did I live? Gasps came from the air. You have to hide. I'll explain later, Roy said. He then made a complex gesture with his left hand and held it high up over his head. The shield of Heliotrop opened up like a black umbrella and deflected the incoming fireballs. Roy summoned his minion, and a frost atronach came jumping out a maroon sphere. It stood before Gawain, protecting him. Roy fired off another bolt and appeared at the spot the fireballs were launched. He took a deep breath and... Fuzz! The power of the bones crossed dimensions and lent immense power to Roy's shout. The antechamber rumbled from the waves of the shout as if it were hit by a devastating earthquake. A grunt came from nowhere, and Rai, Ans fell like a bird with broken wings, his invisibility spell dispelled. His face was bloody, his mind torn apart by a thousand knives. Everything was spinning, and a look of agony painted his face. All his bones were crushed, and not an ounce of strength would respond to his summon. Someone propped him up and held a blade to his neck, drawing a line of blood. The witcher's icy voice hissed into his ear, All right, Rience, I'm not a generous man, so you have one option. Roy looked around, trying to look for the masked sorceress, but there was only silence. Not a drop of blood was left behind. She's probably escaped, I think. He turned back to Rience. Contact your master, I'd like to talk. Chapter 555, Vilgefortz the Frost Atronach and Gawain were searching the corner carefully for the sorceress. At the same time, Rience had conjured a screen of light. A short-haired, burly man in a knight's attire stood within the screen. Behind him were rows of bookshelves and a vat filled with water. Roy could vaguely see an endless beach outside the window behind the man. Vilgefortz looked at his subordinate, and he tensed up a little. Surprised, he said, What happened, Rience? A man was holding a blade seemingly made out of bones to Rience's throat. Rience's face was contorted in pain, guilt and frustration filling his eyes. His pupils were slightly dilated, and with a weak voice he said, I apologize, Master Vilgforts, the brat. One more unnecessary word and my hands might just slip. The man stuck his head out. He had short black hair and eyes of golden and silver hue. He seemed conflicted. The man warned Rience, you'd better make peace with the gods when that happens. Rience froze and stopped talking. Hello, Vilgefortz, master sorcerer, member of the Brotherhood, and beloved figure of the continent's rulers. Your reputation precedes you. Roy spaced out for a moment. After so many ordeals, he finally met Vilgefortz, the sorcerer who easily defeated Geralt and burned a higher vampire to cinders. Vilgefortz, age 68 years old, gender male. Status, Sorcerer, Druid, Alchemist, Member of the Sorcerer Brotherhood, HP, 320, Mana, Strength, 32, Constitution, 32, Dexterity, 25, Charisma, 16, Spirit, Skills, Source, Elementalist, Level 8, Staff Mastery, Level 10, Quick Spell Mastery, Level 10, Meditation, Level 10, Teleportation, Level 10, Mirror Image, Level 10, Anti-Gravity Field, Level 10, Chromatic Barrier, Level 10, Shadow Escape Level 10, Empathic Probe Level 10, Astrology Level 5, more than 300 skills hidden. Roy inhaled sharply. He knew Vilgefortz was powerful, but this was beyond his imagination. The multitude of spells he knew alone vastly overpowered Roy's repertoire, and his incredible stats meant he was also as much an experienced fighter as he was a sorcerer. In the original timeline, Geralt and Vilgefortz battled during the political shift in Thened, a few years down the line. With his skill with the staff, Vilgefortz broke Geralt's legs, and the White Wolf's legs weren't the same since then. In the game, this translated to Geralt taking lethal fall damage if he were to jump off the height of a one-story building or more. In a real battle, Roy would be crushed in a few exchanges. Vilgefortz was the strongest enemy he had seen to date, but he would not run away. If he failed to take Vilgefortz down, this man would stop at nothing until he destroyed the witchers and the children. You seem to have seen me before, but I can't say the same about you, said Vilgefortz calmly. He stared at the young witcher, particularly the viper medallion hanging around his neck. He didn't remember ever seeing this lad before. 
Name's Roy, a nobody who got dragged into your schemes. I see. What a surprise. Vilgefort smiled. There was praise and mockery in his smile. I'm impressed, Witcher. You managed to escape, despite the heavy assault from Scoia'tael and Eternal Fire's guards. Not only that, you captured Reance and established contact with me. You're a top-notch escape artist, if I've ever seen one. Very well, name your terms. Vilgefortz crossed his arms nonchalantly. What will it take for you to let him go? Your rabid dogs have been running around attacking anyone they see. I wonder if you're as mad as they are. If you have even an ounce of shame left in you, you'll come over right away. Roy sneered. Then you'll tell the people of Novigrad all about your conspiracy, and I demand you apologize to me and my brethren. Vilgefortz smiled mirthlessly. That is an amusing request, Roy. Despite this being our first meeting, you're already making unreasonable demands. If that insult is your way to get at me, then it is a lowly strategy indeed. Someone's mad, Roy smiled. Didn't think a member of the Sorcerer Brotherhood would be so fickle. Oh, but I'm not done. We're not the only ones you owe an apology to. There's also Pavetta and Siri, who lost her home and family because of your scheme. No, an apology isn't enough. You will pay for your mistakes with your own life. Ah, Pavetta. Vilgefort smiled again, but there was surprise in his eyes. How did you know of her? Are you a relative of Emhire, or might you be the descendant of that ship's sailor? Memories were dragged up. It was back in the day when Emhir was not yet emperor. He was still Duni, the husband of Pavetta and the son-in-law of Calanth. Calanth kept an incredibly close eye on Duni, giving him no chance to escape, and thus, Duni contacted Vilgefortz in secret, requesting that he create a storm while he, Pavetta, and Siri were coming back from Skellige. Pavetta, however, saw through her husband's scheme, and she left Siri in Skellige. When the storm hit, she refused to work with Duni and lost her life in Sedna Abyss. Duni made his return to Nilfgaard and emerged triumphant in his bid for the throne, and he became the emperor of Nilfgaard, the tyrant of the south, and the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies, Emhir Var Emres. Ever since then, Emmer has been in close contact with the sorcerer. Vilgefortz knew that almost everyone on the Drakkar died in the storm. Besides Emhir and himself, no one knew the true story of that accident. Even Calanth was kept in the dark. She was oblivious to the fact that her daughter's husband and killer had become the emperor of Nilfgaard, in all his cruelty, Emhire destroyed the kingdom of Sintra to hide this ugly past. So how did the Witcher find out? Pity I can't read his mind through the screen. Oh, that's not the only thing I know, Vilgefortz. Consider my offer carefully. Open a portal and come over so we can talk. Maybe I can talk some sense into you, Roy said. Reance, his hostage, was looking somber. Roy, is it? You might have not realized this, but your hands are shaking. You're nervous, fearful. Vilgefortz's eyes shone like beacons. The Witchers are infamous now. The people of Novigrad no longer think of you as heroes. Your brethren are all but dead. Submit and plead for my pity. Show your true self and release Ryans. Be genuine enough, and I might find it in myself to spare you. Vilgefortz held his fingers together and placed them before his lips. Your resistance is futile. It will only destroy you in the end. You might not realize this, Vilgefortz, but there's weakness in your voice. You're too scared to show yourself. Roy pulled Rance closer to himself and held his chin up, forcing the sorcerer to look at his master. The witcher held his blade tighter. And to think you risked your life to start a war for this piece of human scum. Even if I were to kill you right in front of him, he will not feel an ounce of sadness for you. You are nothing but his pawn, a disposable piece in his game of chess he can always replace you with something else. No, please, have mercy. Rience's arrogance was completely erased. He broke down and cried loudly, as though he was poultry trying to struggle for dear life before the butcher could kill it. You still choose to go against me, Witcher? Vilgefortz questioned. He narrowed his eyes, his calm attitude gone, replaced by icy fury. Roy laughed and slit Rience's throat open. The sorcerer's windpipe was slashed, and blood spurted out like a fountain, drenching the screen in red. Reince the spy, the sorcerer and servant of Vilgefortz, was killed in the face of his master. He gurgled, his eyes filled with the longing for life and frustration of dying before his time. My master has yet to become the North's ruler, 
and I have yet to claim my reward. I cannot. Rience's head went limp, and he fell to the ground face first, his breath gone. Roy let go of the corpse and stared at Viljeforts. That's for the innocent lives lost to your schemes, and the lives of my brethren you ruined. This is B, at the beginning, Vilgeforts. You're next. Vilgeforts harumphed, and the screen went dark. A gale howled within the antechamber, and a dark portal opened up behind the Witcher. Noticing that, Gawain hurled a fireball at the portal, and it hit the invisible Lydia. Lydia let out a scream and rolled into the portal, holding her sliced-off arm. A split second before the portal could close, Roy pulled his crossbow's trigger, and a bolt hurtled into the portal. The air around the Witcher rippled, and he disappeared into thin air. Everything around him changed. When he blinked back into reality, Roy found himself transported to a dim, dark hall. Looming pillars held up the arched ceiling, and a spindly, spider-like chandelier hung from above. On the walls of the four sides, gorgeous oil paintings hung. First Landing, Insignia of the Chosen, and Novigradian Union all important historical events where sorcerers played crucial roles in deciding the fate of humanity. So this must be Stiga, Vilgefortz's stronghold. Roy stepped ahead and pulled Lydia out of the pool of her own blood. He placed a pair of dimerishim cuffs on her and staunched her blood loss with a makeshift bandage. Lydia was in a sorry state. Her beautiful blue dress was drenched in the red of blood. She lost one arm, and Roy's bolt blasted her left leg to smithereens before she could get into the portal. Her leg was a mangled mess, and Roy could see the bones jutting out of it. Her shifting mask was still as deadpan as ever, but it was glistening from the rivulets of sweat covering it. Lydia stared at the Witcher in icy silence. She couldn't speak a word even if she wanted to. In a horrifying experiment, she lost her beauty, her chin, and voice. Since that nightmarish incident, Lydia concealed her true face behind a magical mask. She was Vilgefortz's most trusted lieutenant, and Roy could see the concern and fear in her eyes. Even when her life was at stake, she was still putting her master before herself. Lydia was the only member of Vilgefortz's clique that Roy did not hate. Her only sin was that she chose the wrong side and was complicit in spreading his evil. Sounds of footsteps slowly descended the stairs, and the air echoed with Vilgefortz's applause. You are a very brave man, Witcher, said Vilgefortz, his voice laced with magic. Roy couldn't shake the sorcerer's voice out of his head for a while. Lydia's eyes shone with hope and love. Moments ago you were insulting me, and now here you are, alone. Vilgefortz came off the final step, the darkness obscuring his face. He was holding a six-feet-long metal staff in his right hand, his body at ease. The sorcerer took one step ahead, and he split into four identical copies of himself. The copies surrounded the witchers, each as real as the other. Welcome to my castle, witcher. The mirror images stood ten yards away, staring at Roy. They spoke at the same time, their voices echoing and overlapping. The look in their eyes was not icy or deadly. Instead, it almost felt like they were looking at an old friend. For some inexplicable reason, the sorcerer's attitude toward Roy underwent a change, there was even a hint of passion hiding deep within his eyes. I hope you came here for a good enough reason. Finally, we meet Vilgefortz. Roy propped up the listless sorceress, looking around cautiously. Even with the power of observe, Roy could not see which one was the real Vilgefortz. Still, he had to stay calm in the face of this formidable enemy. This was different from their short meeting through the screen. Seeing Vilgefortz for himself told Roy how powerful this man was. His mana was overflowing and shone like the sun, his magical barrier made of chromatic shades, bolts and arcs of electricity danced around him. Roy couldn't be sure which one was the real Vilgefortz, but his temples were throbbing, his elder blood yelling out a warning. This castle was home to a danger far greater than Gruffid the higher vampire. I have a feeling you know me and my story well. The mirror images Lou, Ked at Roy curiously. Can you tell me where we've met before? Roy looked around in silence. The medallion before his neck buzzed. The mana in the air rippled for a moment and quickly disappeared. Vilgefortz was surprised. All the mind-reading spells he threw at the Witcher were rendered ineffective. It was as though the spells had slammed into a wall that refused them access. He's born with anti-mind-reading abilities. Roy did not answer. Vilgefortz turned his gaze to the moaning Lydia, 
and he changed the subject. Be gentle with Lydia. She's a good girl, and she deserves no torment. Vilgefortz was gentle, but not out of love. He was only caring for a good lieutenant. This was just him being professional. The mirror images smiled. The fact you barged into my home and didn't attack right away means there's room for negotiations. If you release Lydia and allow her to nurse her wounds, I will let Rience's death slide. The mirror images took a collective step forward. The sorcerer was genuine. And then we can talk, equally and fairly, without any grudge or bad blood between us. You have a lot of questions about me, and so do I about you. A witcher possessing this many abilities is unheard of, and I do love making friends with powerful people. If we set aside our prejudice, perhaps we can strike a deal. Just because I'm young doesn't mean I'm gullible, Vilgefortz, Roy refused. He knew this man was a cunning old bastard. I don't trust you, but you got one part right. Lydia's the only one in your clique who's sound of mind. Roy looked into Vilgefortz's eyes. Shiru and Riance are fucked in the head, more or less. If I'm right, Lydia is also a painter, isn't she? Everything on these walls is made by her. I can see that she loves you deeply. She would do anything for you, even if it meant her death. But you've never responded to her feelings. Roy stared at the sorcerer. He was trying to use words as his weapon, attempting to break Vilgefort's facade even a little, but the sorcerer was unfazed. You're the one who proposed a deal. I would like to see a gesture. Tell me, have you ever loved Lydia? The witcher launched his second attack, and Lydia froze. She then breathed heavily. Probing into another man's private matters is a peculiar hobby. Vilgefort's pupils contracted for a moment before he fell into silence. A gust of icy wind howled through the halls, the fire in the hearth crackling. The light of the fire projected shadows upon the faces of the chamber's occupants. Witcher, Lydia is a remarkable assistant. She's reliable, caring, and selfless. I trust her completely. He knew Lydia was staring at him, and he accepted that stare. But that is all. I am no longer young enough to be swayed by love. Women are on a lower level of evolution, and that's why they're more easily swayed by their feelings. Lydia hung her head low, the light in her eyes dim, her heart freezing over. Suddenly, she hated the Witcher. Couldn't he let me at least hold on to this dream of mine? Why must he destroy my fantasy? I have a more important goal to reach. Vilgefortz was, to an extent, an idealist. His face was almost glowing golden when he spoke of his goal. And I will sacrifice anything for that, even Lydia's life. Do not attempt to use her as a hostage or a chip for your goals. It will not work. Look at the skies above whenever you are making a decision, Roy. Vilgefortz then blurted his famous quote. Do not mistake stars reflected in a pond for the night sky. You will find yourself in a predicament indeed. Chapter 556 Ten years of scheming sunlight shone into the dim chamber of the castle, the fire in the hearth flickering and crackling, illuminating the six silhouettes standing in confrontation against each other. Four were mirror images of Vilgefortz, donned in night attire and equipped with a steel staff. They surrounded the Witcher, who stood in the center of the chamber, right beside the settee. And he was holding an injured sorceress as hostage. I have answered your question, Roy. Now it's time to uphold your promise, said Vilgefortz calmly. Release Lydia. At least let her not suffer. Roy mused over his options and didn't argue. I can act this out. I have to. I only have one chance, and I have to find out who the real Vilgefortz is, or he's going to come back with a vengeance. Released from the shackles binding her, Lydia leaned on the settee sitting before the hearth, though the air around her reeked of sorrow. She was heartbroken by Vilgefortz's answers. Roy took a seat near her. Good. I like people who hold their word. The mirror images smiled brightly, their gaze toward the Witcher a little warmer. And now it's my turn to ask questions. Then you get a turn. Fair, don't you think? So how'd you know of the real story of Pavetta's death? A skellige sailor survived the ordeal. I ran into him, and he told me the truth, Roy said. He pretended to be thinking, as though that would fool Vilgefortz. Vilgefortz was displeased. A mere sailor could never have guessed that Emher and Dunny were the same person, nor could he realize that Vilgefortz was the one pulling the strings from the shadows. He's hiding a lot of secrets. My turn. I'm very interested in your early life. Roy looked at the mirror image on the left. 
sharply, he asked, were you born an orphan or did your parents abandon you? If Vilgefortz was an emotionally sensitive person like Geralt, the question would hit him hard. He would either look sad or angry, but the mirror images were unfazed. They were as calm and collected as ever. This part of Vilgefortz's life was nothing but a distant past. You seem to have an obsession with my private life, Vilgefortz smiled. But yes, when I was five, my parents, both of whom are sources, abandoned me. I was left with a group of beggars in Lan Exeter's slums. Like a poor stray, I had to beg for the citizens' mercy and rummage through dumps for scraps. I had to fight scores of beggars sometimes just for a piece of moldy bread, said Vilgefortz, unashamed. Though the food was scarce and rotten, I managed to survive for years. Lydia listened intently. Vilgefortz had never told her of his story. And that's how you answer questions, Roy, with honesty and detail. No, no omissions or secrets. Do not let your feelings alter how you look at your story. I expect you to follow this rule from here on out. The mirror images looked at Roy. Similarly, I am interested in your story as well. Why did you walk the path of a witcher instead of a sorcerer? Does the mystique of magic not intrigue you? The mana you radiate is leaps and bounds higher than any witcher. That is proof of your talent. Vilgefortz took a deep breath. It was almost as if he could smell the taste of chaos energy. If you'd attended Ban Ard, you could have been a brilliant magical apprentice. Then all you had to do was apply yourself, and you'd graduate as a full-fledged sorcerer. Roy looked around. The mirror images were completely in sync. They even blinked at the same time. Destiny steered me away from that path. I met a witcher first. A monster was on the verge of killing my family, and that was the only path to power I had, so I took it. I needed some form of power if I wanted to control my destiny, Roy said, his story mostly true. Vilgefortz nodded. You are certainly different from a lot of people. First time I've heard someone willingly take on the trials to be a witcher. You saw an opportunity and seized it instead of resting on your laurels. Had you lived life like a normal person, your dreams and passions would have been crushed, bay, ye the mundane lifestyle, but that's not who you are. You have ambition, and you take action, the sorcerer praised. It's my turn now. Roy shrugged the compliment aside. How did destiny set you on the path of magic, then? You're stubborn, aren't you? Vilgefortz shook his head and caressed the staff he was holding. Three years had gone by since I was abandoned. I was dying in a squalid ditch, starving and ravenous. Then a group of druids who hailed from the Kovir Circle took me in and raised me. Druids are a bunch of misfits. Tramps and bizarre people who travel the world and worship oaks. My talent was then discovered during one of their rituals, and they taught me how to meditate, fight, and use magic. They taught me how to get along with nature and society at large. This itinerant life continued until I was twenty years old. I had no interest in the philosophy of druids. It makes no sense. They think understanding and getting along in peace is the way of life, but if I had followed their rules, the slums of Lan Exeter would have devoured me whole. Might makes right. That's the only truth in this world, Vilgefortz declared, his voice echoing across the chamber. There was not an ounce of gratitude in his voice. There was only arrogance. Despite their abandoning me, my parents left with me all their magical talents, and before long, I mastered all the spells the druids had. Tired of their incessant lecturing about nature, I refused their invitation into the Brotherhood, and so I left to wander life by myself. Aside from his skills with a staff and nature magic, Vilgefortz was far detached from druids, who wanted nothing to do with fame or power. The sorcerer was never shy about making his desire for power known. How did you build your organization, Roy? Vilgefortz asked. Witchers are lone wolves. They would never build an organization of their own. Times have changed. The disunity of witchers was the reason they fell into decline. Eventually, everyone came to think of them as weak. Roy shook his head. They slander and discriminate, pushing us further into the sidelines, and now our numbers dwindled so much, we're almost extinct. Being a part of this group means I must make some changes to get along with the times. That's why I convinced my brethren to gain allies in witchers from different schools. The process has not been easy, but it has borne fruit. Roy's eyes roved over the mirror images. Or at least it was going well until your schemes ruined it. 
Don't let your emotions sway you. Vilgefort smiled. There was praise in his eyes. If I'd known the Witchers had someone like you in their midst, I'd have never let Shiru or Rian sabotage you. We could have had a peaceful talk and struck a deal. We're alike, you and I. I'm a sorcerer, you're a Witcher. We both live long lives. We both have mastery over chaos energy. We both wander the land and bring change to it. We both have ambition, said Vilgefortz. We both seek change. Lydia was staring at the men before her. Both were handsome and powerful. One was the strongest sorcerer she knew, while the other was the most powerful witcher on this land. No other witcher could slaughter sorcerers as easily as Roy did. We're different. Roy shook his head. All I want is to give my friends and family the best life they can have. I do not harm anyone else if I can help it, but you, you destroyed a whole kingdom for your ambition. So many families are broken, all because of you. And you think that's a mistake? I disagree, said Vilgefortz. It's every man for himself. As long as it sits right with me, anything goes. Do not let any trivial matter stand in the way of your ambition. Mercy and emotions are nothing but obstacles on the way to ambition and success. Roy was silent. He couldn't convince Vilgefortz to stop his ambition, nor could Vilgefortz convince Roy to abandon his humanity. And now it's my turn. Why'd you join the Brotherhood after your departure from the Druids? Yes, they're both spellcasters, but their philosophies are fun, daymentally different. One tried their best to diminish their influence on nature and society, while the other worked in a different and opposite direction. As I've mentioned, I started wandering the land after my departure, Vilgefortz explained patiently. At first, I was in a daze, ambitionless, pathless, and so I tried my hand at multiple professions to see what kind of path was right for me. I was a soldier, a bandit, a spy, an assassin, a wandering merchant, and more. I saw what this world had to offer. Reminiscence flared in Vilgefortz's eyes. He looked a little dazed, and Roy tensed up, staring around. He clenched his fists but loosened up a moment later. He couldn't destroy Vilgefortz in one go. Then I'll buy more time. I wasted nearly six years of my life before I came to the conclusion that none of those lives were what I wanted. In my younger years, I fell in love with a sorceress. It was the first time in my life that I poured my heart out for someone else. Roy narrowed his eyes. Love? This scheming bastard used to love? Lydia pursed her lips tightly. But the sorceress was arrogant, vicious, cold, and heartless. I was but one of her many lovers, a weakling firmly under her control. There were times where she would have fun with me in the day, only to spread her legs for another man at night. Tired of her licentious behavior, I left. I mused over the meaning of love. Vilgefort smiled at Roy. And I came to the realization that romance is nothing but a toy to pass the lull in our lives with. I couldn't trust my own parents to care for me, let alone a woman I only fostered a relationship with when we were already adults. The mirror images nodded and circled the Witcher, as if agreeing with his own conclusion. That was growth, I postulated, and since then, I have not been the slave to my emotions. He looked at Roy. Witchers are blessed in this regard. Your mutations eradicate your emotions in the process, granting you greater focus on self-improvement. That is just one of many possibilities that might arise from our mutations, Roy explained. I'd rather not become an emotionless cog. Let's get back to you. What happened next? In my youth, I detested my parents who left me to rot. I detested the woman who slept with anyone she liked even when she had me. They were all sorcerers, and my hate drove me to curiosity. I wished to find out what sorcerers were really like. Viljeforts grinned. Herbert Stamelford, one of the Brotherhood's founders, took notice of my talents and extended an invitation to me. I took it and devoted myself to this organization. With my overwhelming talent, I picked up magic at a blistering pace. When I was thirty years old, I'd already mastered more magic than even the oldest fossils. And then everything I'd ever wanted opened up to me easily. Power, coin, women, status. Even the sorceress I used to love answered to my every beck and call. Vilgforts had a heart of steel, tempered by the hardships of his youth. And he had a soul of arrogance thanks to his talent. What about you? How did you come to possess your abilities? Roy feigned ignorance. Whatever might you mean, I am but a regular witcher. Honesty is the rule of this game, Roy. 
I told you all of my private affairs, and I expect you to be honest as well. Vilgefortz shook his head. Lydia has told me everything about that battle. Telepathy, if you must know. You have the power of space and even, Vilgefortz adamantly said. This is not something granted by Witcher mutation. Vilgefortz's eyes shone brightly. I am sure no mutation can grant the power of time and space, or the Brotherhood would have been an unstoppable force. Do not try to lie, or this conversation will come to an end. Roy mused over his options and decided to give Vilgefortz a crumb of information to buy some time. Child of the Sun, I ingested a plant of that name before. That's how I came to possess the power of space. You mean the dwarven affine? The devil's tail? The one they call Fee Nuid in elder speech? The mirror eye, eh? Mage's eyes shone like lit candles, and they stepped closer to the Witcher. Have you heard of it? Of course, one of the most coveted herbs of all time. Divine beauty needs it, but dwarven affine is long extinct, from what I know. Then I was extremely fortunate to find one in a forest. Only one was available, however. A momentary silence fell upon the hall. Vilgefortz was taking an even bigger interest in the Witcher. Roy took a deep breath and huddled closer to Lydia. The next question he asked was a monumental one. I'd like to know about your relationship with Emher Var Emreis, the Emperor of Nilfgaard. Every single detail of it from how you know him until your present-day relationship with him. Vilgefortz hesitated for a long time, his eyes twinkling. Once again, the Witcher brings up my relationship with Emhir. That's supposed to be a secret. Vilgefortz did not ask how Roy came to know of that secret. He had a guess at who this Witcher was. As mentioned, I used to be a merchant. Old habits die hard, and after I became a sorcerer, I still kept some habits from my trading days with me investing being one of them. Regular investments only yield coin and fame, however, and I was not satisfied with just that. And so, I turned my gaze to an ousted prince. Thirty years ago, the Empire of Nilfgaard witnessed a political shift. Emir's father Fergus was ousted, and the usurper cursed Emir, turning him into Duni. The cursed prince traveled to Marnadal, escaping with his life. Still, he was a prince. There was a chance he could reclaim his throne. The returns for that investment alone would be astronomical. Risky too, but I like risks. And so I invested in Emir. Vilgefortz looked proud, and he didn't hide anything from Roy. I gave him guidance. On a rainy night in 1237, he was to save Calantha's husband, Rogner of Ebbing, and he invoked the law of surprise like I told him to. The law bound him to Calanthe's unborn daughter, Pavetta. She became his unexpected child. The law is unbreakable. Pavetta grew up, and she found herself attracted by Duni. They had an affair when Pavetta was in her teenage years. Eventually, Duni impregnated her. And Pavetta's child, Siri, becomes Geralt's unexpected child. What a twist of fate. Difference is, Geralt only sees Siri as his child instead of a concubine. Duni, however, married his unexpected child, and in a bid to lay claim to Sintra's throne, he considered marrying Pavetta's child too. Sick bastard. And the rest is history. The shipwreck at Sedna Abyss, Dunny's escape, his return to Nilfgaard, murdering of the usurper, reclaiming of the throne, regaining of his name, and invasion of Sintra. You know that fairly well, don't you? Roy nodded. Empire's successful ascension to the throne gave me incredible returns, but the reward is yet to be claimed. Not until his army has taken over most of the north, that is. Emhir made a promise to Vilgefortz. Once the north became Nilfgaard's land, Vilgefortz would be the highest-ranking official of the province. He would be second to only Emmar in terms of power. Roy wasn't happy with that answer. Honesty is the name of the game, Vilgefortz. You didn't help Emmer just to rule over the north. What are you trying to say? Vilgefortz crossed his arms over his chest. Your saboteur in Novigrad forced us to make a desperate attempt at survival, but I know you only did it to get your hands on Siri. The mirror images laughed, their grins wide. And why are you laughing? Because you just proved my conjecture. This is a miracle. The mirror images looked at the Witcher with passion. They gushed. Yes, my assistance to Empire's rule and sending Rience on a search for Ciri are for something else. Power and rulership are just the bonus that comes with the job. My real goal is Ciri's elder blood. The blood that controls time and space of countless worlds power, and the ultimate truth. That is what us sorcerers seek. Human greed is never-ending and I am not excluded. 
Vilgefortz's voice echoed across the chamber, filled with a membition. Lydia fell in love with him all over again, her eyes filled with infatuation. I am tired of whatever this world has to offer. I wish to gain the elder blood and cross the barriers of space. I wish to witness what lies in the worlds beyond our own. The northern kingdoms are but specks in the infinite realms. And do you know why I tell you so much, Roy? Do you know why I am so honest with you? Roy took a deep breath. Because you are privileged. Vilgefortz looked at Roy. Lamentation and praise flickered in his eyes. It almost felt like he was seeing the ideal version of himself. I do not believe the story of the dwarven affine. It is just an excuse. You have shown to possess the power of space. That's how you blinked in and out of existence. You also have the power of clairvoyance. That's how you saw my secrets. And you used the power of time to heal that dying Doppler, didn't you? You too possess the power of Elder Blood Roy. Chapter 557 Battle of Stiga. You possess the Elder Blood, the mirror images declared, their voices shaking the dim chamber. Lydia froze and stared at the deadpan Witcher in awe. Her master spent ten years just to get his hands on the coveted bloodline, and the Witcher had it. You possess the power of Elder Blood. The mirror images looked at Roy and brought up a certain past action of his. And your friends with Geralt and Ciri, you went against Ryan's to keep her safe. That means you've lent your assistance to Sintra before. Through your powers of clairvoyance, you told them of Nilfgaard's invasion. You're the reason Sintra's king launched a large-scale persecution of spies, asked Tamaria for help, requested for Skellige's druids to clear the storms, and set up an ambush in Marnadal. You're the one who slaughtered Nilfgaard's sorcerers in Marnadal. You're the one who ambushed Menno in the Battle of Sintra. You're the one who almost ruined my plans. Vilgefortz's eyes were flaring brightly. Roy took a deep breath, the hand behind his back shaking slightly. He figured out all my actions just from the scarce info Lydia fed him. As smart as I expected, Roy shook his head and smiled. I don't know what you're talking about. I cannot see through your mind nor your destiny. That kind of mind concealment is a hallmark ability of the Elder Blood. You cannot deny it. This is a miracle, Vilgefortz gushed. All the tomes and books I scoured were adamant that the Elder Blood only flowed through the veins of Calanthe's bloodline. Roy interrupted. Then why didn't you go for Calanthe or Pavetta? Why'd you set your sights on Ciri? The Witcher had always wanted to know the answer to that. If Calanthe, Pavetta, and Ciri all had the Elder Blood, there was no reason for Vilgefortz to go for Ciri and let Dunny marry Pavetta instead. Simple. Calanthe and Pavetta do not have as strong a bloodline as Ciri. Ciri's blood must have gone through the atavism process, granting it more power. And she is at a ripe age now. Her firstborn will inherit the purest form of the Elder Blood, and that's what I am going after. A chill ran down Roy's spine. Vilgefortz continued. But you, you're a witcher unrelated to Calanth or her bloodline, yet you managed to get your hands on the Elder Blood. How did you do it? Vilgefortz had an almost manic look on his face, desiring nothing more than Roy's answer. Tell me, and I shall give you anything your heart desires, be it status, coin, women, power. Roy smiled. A certain entity tried to make the same offer before, and in the end, Roy put him under a self-imposed exile for ten years. Child of the Sun, that's what happened. That's the truth. Do not test my patience, Witcher. Vilgefort slowly stepped ahead, spinning his staff around deftly, preparing for battle. If you wish to protect Ciri, then you will tell me how you gained the Elder Blood, and I shall lay my hands off her. There is an insurmountable difference between our abilities. If we do battle, you will not come out alive, said Vilgefortz arrogantly. Lend your assistance, work with me, and once I gain the Elder Blood, this world shall be our oyster. And not just this world we can go on a journey to the worlds beyond together. Vilgefortz grinned brightly. Can you feel it? The strongest witcher and the strongest sorcerer journeying together? What a sight it will be! Roy looked at the sorcerer with wariness and contempt. Sorry, but I refuse. I sense contempt in your eyes. Did you find the secret lab of this castle? Roy said nothing, but that was as good an answer as it was for Vilgefortz. The sorcerer circled around Roy and patiently persuaded, Roy, people are divided into different castes since the day they were born. Those who have power not only have control over their destiny, 
they have control over everyone else's as well. That's the undisputed truth. The women in my lab are weak, and many of them have died, but their sacrifice told me something important, and through them, I gleaned the method to extract the elder blood. They died for something noble. Vilgefort sounded so matter-of-fact. You have the elder blood flowing within you. Do not let mercy or emotion sway your will. You make a persuasive argument. Roy nodded and shook his head. But you are missing one important element. Which is? The mirror images cocked their eyebrows and leaned ahead, ready to listen. Humanity. Roy looked at the image on the left, and he clenched his fists. You think of yourself as a god, Vilgefortz. But what makes you think you have the right to dictate the lives of innocent souls? You captured innocent women and forced them to bear children, putting them through torture just to prove your sick theory correct? You're out of your mind. Vilgefortz wasn't angry. Instead, he smiled, though sardonically. Am I hearing this right? A vagabond witcher talking about humanity with me? A sorcerer and a member of the Brotherhood? Why, you have a noble soul, but don't you see? After that fiasco in Novigrad, you should know that those peasants care nothing about humanity. Talk sense to them all you want, and all you get in return is nothing but fear, prejudice, and curses. In that case, you should prove their fears right and destroy them. Humanity? That's an excuse for those too weak to seek power. Vilgefortz's mirror images surrounded Roy. Do not let humanity bind you, Roy. This life is a game of chess, and you're a player, not a pawn. Give the game your all. Do not let anything sway you. The mirror images were dangerously close. One more step and they would be crossing the line. They were extending their hands to Roy. Join me, and we shall create an empire. Do not worry. You're no virgin, nor are you a woman. You cannot be impregnated. My theory will not work on you, and by extension, I won't hurt you. Roy covered his face and took a deep breath. Very tempting offer, Vilgefortz. He didn't bother hiding his hesitation. If he'd run into Vilgefortz instead of Latho when he first came to this world, the arrogant sorcerer might have taken him down a completely different path than he'd chosen, but destiny had made its choice for Roy. But I refuse. Why? Because I have friends, family, and those I love. Love is the foundation of humanity, and you ask for me to relinquish it. If I do that, I may cross the point of no return, Roy said, struggling with himself. I see, you're still young, still lacking in experience, you are yet blind to the truth. The mirror images stared at Roy. Imperiously, he said, you require a mentor, and I can take that role. The witcher and the sorcerer locked eyes. One had a soul filled with desire and ambition, the other filled with fighting spirit. A gale howled within the castle, the fire in the hearth crackling along. A blob of crimson silhouette was projected onto the wall, and it was dancing. Then, a gigantic octopus leapt from beneath the witcher, flailing its infinite tentacles around. The mirror images around Roy remained confident and collected. Then the tentacles wrapped them up, and something tore through the air. A crimson flash arced across the chamber and split the mirror images in two, but not a drop of blood was drawn. The images shattered and disappeared, melding into air like popped bubbles. They're all mirror images. Roy's heart sank, and he quickly covered himself with magical barriers. The kaleidoscopic circle of Yurden shone underneath him, and the Witcher held his blade tightly, scanning the chamber as hard as he could. The walls, the hearth, the candelabra, the settee, the table, and Lydia. He checked everything, but Vilgefortz was nowhere to be found. As obstinate as ever, Roy. Vilgefort's mocking voice assailed Roy from all directions, as if he had countless mirror images talking to him everywhere. Do you really think you can kill me, just because you managed to kill Reance and the elven sorcerers? You are on my turf. I have the home advantage, but I'm generous. I'll make you realize the gap between us. Why don't you show me how much of your bloodline's strength you have awakened? The boom of thunder roared across the air, and blinding flashes of light illuminated the chamber, arcing through the air like electric snakes. The settee was sent flying to the wall like a capsized boat. Lydia was buried underneath, and she grunted before she went completely silent. Roy's magical barriers were shattered in an instant, but before the magical attack could completely numb him, he fired off a shot. The bolt hurtled through the air, and sparks flew as a steel staff hit it. The staff only appeared for a split second, 
but it managed to deflect the bolt. At the same time, Roy disappeared from the center of the explosion and reappeared at the staircase, tendrils of smoke billowing from him. He stood like a bow that was pulled, erundite held to his side like an arrow poised to shoot. The Witcher held his blade against a vague silhouette at the staircase. Crimson halos swirled behind him, and like a bloody boa constrictor, the crimson light slithered up the blade. Vilgefortz was standing a few yards away. In his right hand was his staff, and he made a simple gesture with his left hand. Flames roared forth, and mana howled. Hellfire exploded before the Witcher, and the dragon made of flames engulfed him. The explosion shook the chamber, and debris rained from the ceiling. The Witcher hurtled across the air as though he was hit by a siege weapon squarely in the chest. He crashed into the wall, and cracks spread across the granite. The painting of First Landing fell to the ground, clinking. The rancid stench of smoke permeated the air, and the Witcher fell to the ground, spewing blood. His limbs were trembling, his skin charred and red. White smoke hissed upon the Witcher's flesh, as if he were cooked over open fire. His HP was reduced by a staggering two-third of its original value, but at least he found Vilgefortz's real body. He looked at the sorcerer and left a gem marking on him. The silhouette at the staircase shook his head, holding a lightning ball in his left hand. I told you, Roy. I know all about you, but you know nothing of my power. For more than thirty years I have not met my equal in this land. There's a reason I'm bored of this place. I have mastered 335 spells, and I can kill you in more than 10,000 ways. I can make your life a living hell. You could have just worked with me, but you had to be difficult. Roy grunted and jerked away before the lightning ball could hit him. The ball slammed into the wall behind Roy, and an arc of electricity touched his armor. He trembled. Activate. A wave of warmth gushed through his veins, healing Roy and returning his charred skin to its earlier state. Vilgefortz clicked his tongue. Roy quickly made the sign of clamp, and his mirror image jumped out of the magical stream, defending him. Before the mirror image could take the crossbow, however, the air boomed, and the ground shook. Vilgefortz fired off multiple spells, and the elements spun and spun, eventually forming a chromatic torrent of magic. The torrent swallowed Roy's mirror image and shattered it to pieces, but then a great silhouette appeared and took the torrent head on. The black dragon tore the attack to pieces, and it lashed its tail around, destroying the pillars holding the ceiling up. The ground was upturned and shattered like it was tilled by a gigantic hoe. As the dragon flapped its wings, furniture, decor, and even the chandelier fell. Dust and debris flew in all directions, and the dragon opened its maw. The witcher charged ahead with his blade in hand. His hair was burned, his face covered in blisters and black veins, his eyes were firmly locked upon the sorcerer standing near the staircase, his ivory blade humming shrilly, ready for battle. The witcher took a deep breath. Fuss! Ripples spread across the air. The beams cracked, the walls trembled, the window and glass objects shattered into pieces. The shout hit Vilgefortz, or it seemed to be the case. His smile faded, and for a moment he was dazed. That split-second wah is enough for the dragon. It was already inches away from him. Fear. The witcher's eyes were dyed crimson, and a bloody sea raged in the air. Mountainous tentacles burst from the surface, and following those, a terrifying octopus came forth. The air was filled with viscous blood as the octopus wrapped Vilgefortz up, compressing him bit by bit. The dragon smashed a hole through the staircase, and Roy stabbed his blade through the tentacles and pinned Vilgefortz on the stairs behind him. He whipped out Guire and swung it. A crimson arc of light charged from its edge, illuminating the chamber in red. The cocoon was split apart, and a great gash was left upon the stairs, but Roy was not delighted at all. His heart sank deeper and deeper. There was no indication that he killed Vilgefortz, and the marking he left on the sorcerer disappeared. He crouched and tried to roll away, but then a great wave of mana slammed down on him, keeping him pinned. Pale, rotten hands appeared everywhere around him. Howls from beyond the grave filled the air as the hands grasped Roy's legs. Roy felt a gust of wind coming from behind, and he exerted every ounce of his strength to move away, yet the staff hit him nonetheless. A stab of pain seared from his right cheek, and he fell to the stairs. His nose broke, and his mind was buzzing. 
The Witcher slid down. Vilgefort stood behind him, apparently appearing out of nowhere. He was swinging his metal staff with incredible dexterity, hitting Roy four times. Sounds of bones broken echoed across the chamber. The sorcerer broke all of Roy's limbs, and he flipped his hand, turning Roy around with a wave of invisible magical power. Roy lay limply, his face red, then purple, then green. The Witcher breathed heavily, as if he were suffocating even though there was air all around him. Roy, my friend. Vilgeforts crossed his arms, looking down at Roy with pity. That is all you have? Too little, I'm afraid. You're far too green in combat. You failed to discern where the real me was, though I must admit that my spells are far better than what anyone can conjure. He spoke with concern, as if he were just trying to teach a rowdy protege a lesson. Have you had enough? Do you realize how foolish you've been? I do admire you, I must admit. Your vision, your bloodline, and your fighting prowess for someone your age. They are all top-notch. You're as powerful as I was when I was your age. It's like seeing another me, but alas, my patience is limited. If you refuse to work with me, then you will lose your privilege as a partner. I shall take you as an experimental subject. Roy glared at the sorcerer, and he transported a forgotten acorn from his inventory straight into his mouth, then he gulped furtively. The moment the acorn slid into his belly, a wave of life force enveloped the Witcher. His character sheet shone a bright green. You have ingested a forgotten acorn. Your constitution has exceeded 25 points. You are immune to the acorn's poison. You now gain 5 points for constitution. Constitution 25 30 HP, 100 330, 380 380. Mana, 200 310, 310 310. You are completely healed. Roy balled his fists and looked at Vilgefortz with murder in his eyes, and then a group of towering silhouettes came falling from the skies as they responded to Roy's summon. Chapter 558 End of a Dream The castle shuddered as the silhouettes made their appearance. A great figure appeared within the wrecked chamber. Listless Leviathan stood before the Witcher, defending him. Only a crater was left in the spot Vilgefortz was standing moments ago. A shrill shriek tore through the air as a griffin the size of a buffalo hovered in the air, flapping its wings. The gale it stirred up flailed the furniture around, and the fire in the hearth threatened to go out. Griffin looked around the battlefield. Roy stood between his mounts, quickly casting his magical barriers again. Then a mirror image of Roy and a frost atronach made their appearance, standing by Roy. These were all the minions he could summon for now. The Witcher downed a dose of Thunderbolt and Echidna decoction. Once again, black veins crawled over his face. Then, a blinding flash of lightning tore through the night skies beyond the window, and thunder blasted overhead. An ice giant, a griffin, a mirror image, and a... an elemental? Could this be a spell you created yourself? Color me impressed, Roy. You are perhaps a genius of Aldzor's level. Vilgefortz's voice echoed in the castle. You are far beyond any witcher, but it's a pity your minions are too weak. Countless mirror images flashed around the chamber. They swung their staves around, and magic flared within their hands. Roy could feel the mark. It was right over his head and somewhere over the ceiling. Allow me to demonstrate what a true summoning spell is like. Crimson light flared from within the flames, and an invisible force pulled back the curtains of this realm, revealing a burning space behind. Waves of scorching heat poured into the chamber, raising its temperature by at least 80 degrees. Despite being under his minion's protection, Roy still felt the heat eating away at his flesh and soul. The world behind those unveiled curtains was made of flames. Tall, looming ravines extended infinitely, and a river of steaming hot lava sped down the mountains. Atop the river was a humanoid creature more than 12 feet tall, as if responding to someone's summon, it crawled out of the fireplace. The creature had skin red as flames, back broad as mountains, arms slender as snakes, and an ethereal lower body made of gas. A pair of curled horns jutted from the creature's forehead, and a crown of smoke and lava adorned its head. It had big eyes and a bigger nose, a pair of fangs jutting from its maw. Tendrils of flame slithered from its eyes, nose, and cracks between its teeth. A fiery mane covered its neck and chest. Ifrit, one of the four elementals, let the battle of the minions begin. 
The flame elemental opened its maw and fired off a stream of flames at the Witcher and his minions. Leviathan roared and picked up a broken pillar from the ground. He hurled the pillar at the Ifrit and extinguished its flames before shoving it out of the window. Griffon screeched and charged ahead like the wind, while the Frost Atronach held its fists before itself and hurtled toward the Ifrit. Roy's mirror image pulled the crossbow's trigger, while the real Roy leapt into the air and swung his blade high up into the ceiling. A crimson energy beam tore a hole through the ceiling, and the Witcher went into it. The pillar slammed into the window and tore a large hole in the wall. Sharp, biting winds sprinted into the chamber, arcs of lightning tearing through the skies outside, and then a whip of flames darted through the hole like a tentacle attacking its prey. The whip lashed out at the flying griffin, and she let out a howl as she fell down the cliff like a broken kite, her feathers fluttering everywhere. The whip did not stop its momentum. It kept charging ahead, turning into a hurricane of fire. Roy's mirror image was vaporized under the heat, and then the whip wrapped itself around Leviathan and the Frost Atronach's legs. It yanked them backward, melting the Atronach's ice and sizzling Leviathan's leg. The giant's flesh was quickly cooked and smoke billowed from the Vedemoth wound. The minions roared, but they couldn't stop the whip from pulling them out the hole in the wall. They were pulled down the castle, and the creatures battled on top of the dried-out lake. The Ifrit hovered over the cracked, parched land. It held the giant's neck and armpit, its ethereal legs wrapped around the giant's lower body like a boa constrictor. It almost looked like a titanoboa was constricting a giant gorilla. The Ifrit's flames swirled and shimmered, and tendrils of flames slithered out of Leviathan's pores, igniting him. As if they were alive, the flames snaked into the creature's every single orifice, burning it from within. Leviathan's eyes were red, drool lathering his dry, cracked lips. He roared in rage and agony as he tried to slam and pull the Ifrit's body away. Leviathan jumped and rolled around the ground, cracking it further, but it couldn't break free of the Ifrit's bondage. Griffon screeched to the high heavens and swooped in, trying to swipe away at the Ifrit's back and save Leviathan. The elemental, however, was not made of flesh. It had control over all particles of the element of fire, and it could blink in and out of reality at will. Griffon could never land any attack on fire itself. As it plunged its claws into the Ifrit's body, the Ifrit's flames slithered up its limbs, burning its beautiful feathers. Griffon roared and jumped into the pond to douse the flames. Only the Atronach could stand against the elemental. The frost elemental surrounded itself with the power of ice, circling the Ifrit. Like a boxer in training, the Atronach punched away at the Ifrit. Every time it did, sparks flew, and the frost Atronach's ice doused them. Still, the Atronach was in dire straits. Slowly, its ice was melting. This was but the first bout of battle and the Witcher's minions were at an overwhelming disadvantage. Defeat was a matter of time. Roy was in a maze-like corridor. I won't hold back this time, Roy, warned Vilgefortz. Roy leapt away from the sorcerer's web of electricity and hid behind a pillar. He could feel his mark on the sorcerer standing vaguely beside the pillar on the other side. The sorcerer was drawing mana from the convergence points all around him. Despite the barrage of spells he had unleashed, Vilgefort showed no sign of exhaustion. On the contrary, he was speeding up. Roy tried to hurl a bolt of electricity at the sorcerer, but Vilgefort's chromatic barrier deflected it easily. The sorcerer hurled a blinding beam of light at the Witcher. The flash of light blasted through the pillar Roy was hiding behind, and it grazed Roy's magical barrier. The barrier of Heliotrop was shattered, and the wall around Roy melted away revealing a big hole. Roy hastily rolled away and fired off a bolt. He disappeared and reappeared before Vilgefortz, the Witcher's eyes bloody red. Tentacles burst forth from the Crimson Seas and enveloped Vilgefortz, but Roy couldn't do much more than that. A gust of dark gale moaned in the air, and countless hands of the dead appeared out of thin air. They dragged him into their midst and stopped him cold. Roy felt a wave of chill flow into his blood. The sorcerer and the witcher, both rendered immobile. Their eyes met. Roy's were filled with flames of fury, while Vilgefortz's were filled with mockery and ice-cold calm. A few moments later, the
The bindings were unraveled, and Roy charged at the sorcerer, spinning his blade around. Vilgefort spun his staff, readily accepting the challenge. Despite the power of the decoction and Guardian buffing him and Yurden slowing his enemy down, it took all Roy had just to keep up with the sorcerer's speed. A gust of wind blew down the corridor, the sconces flickering. The air was filled with the moans of mana, the bursts of exploding air, and the clash of metal. A pair of silhouettes leapt and jumped across the battlefield. Roy's blade swung against the whirling staff, their metal glinting coldly. The ground and paintings and ceiling cracked, every time the witcher and sorcerer clashed. Debris fell liberally like gray snow in a deadly winter. Another heavy hit from the staff. Roy could barely fend it off. He tried to strike back like a snake fighting off an eagle. Guire met the metal staff, and it was deflected. The staff hit the wall beside Roy, crushing the marble. A lightning arc streaked across the heavens, the momentary light shining upon the nervous witcher. Rivulets of sweat were pouring down his chin. A small bolt of lightning jumped forth from Vilgefortz's hand, the air crackling in its presence. Right before the lightning arc could hit Roy, the witcher leapt and hung from the ceiling like a lizard. The sorcerer jumped and lashed his staff out at Roy, but Roy managed to evade it milliseconds before he was hit. The staff punctured a hole through the ceiling, revealing the ominous skies above. You're fast, kid, Vilgefortz praised. Roy fired off a bolt, and it passed through the hole in the ceiling. The witcher blinked and reappeared on the top of the castle. He fired off another bolt high into the skies. The air was densely humid at this altitude, and the skies were dark as ink, with streaks of lightning pulsing and strobing within the clouds. From where the bolt stood, the castle of Stiga looked rickety and rundown. Roy was as insignificant as a speck of dust. Vilgefortz appeared at the other side of the castle, his shirt covered in chromatic lights. His force field held up the sorcerer in the air. Vilgefortz tucked his staff away and spread his arms as he moved up high into the skies, the rush of air current billowing his shirt. He pointed in a direction, and thunder boomed. An arc of lightning slithered across the skies, then it slammed down at the witcher's position. But moments before the forked lightning hit, the witcher had blinked away with yet another bolt of his. That was a good show, kid. It has been too long since I had a battle of this caliber, but this is as far as you get. You will fall from the skies, dead as a doornail. Thunder boomed in the clouds over the sorcerer's head, and a sea of lightning rained from the skies. The witcher pulled his crossbow's trigger a few times and blinked a few hundred yards away before the lightning could hit him. The sea of lightning thundered down upon the arid land, basking it in a sea of blinding light. When the light slowly dimmed and faded into obscurity, all that was left were tendrils of smoke billowing from the land. The air was broken down into its different elements, and the stench of ozone filled the surroundings. Roy reappeared on the mountains, spared from the sea of lightning, and then he fired off another bolt at the sorcerer. He reappeared near the enemy and thrust his steel weapon at Vilgefortz. The sorcerer shoved the air, and an invisible force field undulated around him. Roy thought a wyvern just slammed into him. Everything around him spun, and his sword fell out of his hands. The witcher flew backward, and then an arc of lightning slammed into the witcher. His body tensed up, his hair straight from the electricity. A gust of gale blew, and smoke billowed from his body. The witcher was numb, and he was falling to the arid land thousands of feet underneath. But then his eyes snapped open. With the power of Guardian, he used the Ring of Time once more. The lightning's damage was negated, and he pulled the trigger once more. Roy slammed into Vilgefortz's force field once more with his sword in hand, and he jumped back almost immediately. The sorcerer stood high atop the skies like a god, controlling the lightning that ran through the clouds. The witcher hurtled across the high-altitude battlefield like a meteor, streaking in from all directions. He was moving at speeds high enough to leave after images even after the attack had landed. Every time they clashed, stardust would rain down to the land, and then a drop of rain fell, covering the arid land beneath with water. Then a torrential downpour followed, the curtains of water obscuring the sorcerer's sight. The witcher was inches before him. He held his blah, to high up and swung it down at Vilgefortz with every ounce of his strength. 
a crimson crescent moon splintered off the edge of the blade and split the impenetrable force field around Vilgefortz in two. The crimson sea raged once more, and the tentacles swallowed Vilgefortz whole. Before the sorcerer was bound, however, he summoned the Sea of Dead Hands again, binding the Witcher as well. Roy had finally given up on killing Vilgefortz by himself. I'm taking a page out of the enemy's book. He'll be exiled. You wish for a trip to another world? You got it. Roy summoned the power of space, and a black diamond-shaped portal appeared before the cocoon. The tentacle tossed Vilgefortz into the portal like he was a boulder on a catapult. The witcher's heart sank, and everything around him went black. The hands that captured him tossed him into the world gate as well. The void behind the door was dark, dead, and silent. Motes of light strobed and blinked around the path. The sorcerer and the witcher clashed once more, glaring at each other with fury. They spun around, their eyes still locked onto each other. A fraction of a second later, both of them fell to a path leading to an unknown destination. The all-encompassing darkness was replaced by a sea of gorgeous aurora lights. Roy and Vilgefortz fell, but they were held up in the air as if the place around them had no gravity at all. They were like two fish pushed ahead by a violent undercurrent under the sea, pushing them into an abyss. They couldn't breathe, the air was freezing, and frost formed on their brows and lips. Chromatic lights burst around them, particles of all shades of color and elements swirling and swimming in the sea of chaos around them. Underneath the Witcher and the Sorcerer was a blue planet slowly spinning around. They saw the seas, the undulating mountains, and the lush greenery covering the lands of the planet. It was a gorgeous sight, but they were not in the mood to sightsee. The mana within them would not obey their command. Under the disruption of the Sea of Chaos, neither fighter could use any magic. Roy couldn't teleport away, and the ubiquitous chaos energy was eating away at the both of them like acid devouring its victim. Their armor yellowed and rotted, while their skin swelled and turned red. The sea was breaking them down, ready to nourish itself with their flesh and blood. So this is the Elder Blood's power of space travel. What is this place, Roy? Vilgefortz floated before the Witcher, and he was flailing his arms and legs in an attempt to get closer to Roy. Though he resembled someone trying to swim poorly, no matter how much he tried, he could not close the distance. The Sea of Chaos was a place of death. None could live or move in this strip of existence. Vilgefortz's face fell. I have to go back, kid. Let's talk. We can make a trade. The sea swallowed his voice. Roy couldn't hear a word, and the experience was remarkable for him. It was then he realized what this place was. This was the same place Freya showed him during their meeting the strip of chaos energy surrounding the Witcher world, a remnant of the conjunction, the Sea of Chaos. That random teleportation just pushed us to a world of death. The lack of response from Roy infuriated Vilgefortz. He tensed up, his face pale, and a ball of fear grasped his heart. More than fifty years had passed since he left the slums of Lan Exeter, and not once did he feel as scared as he was at that moment. Let me go. He clumsily fought against the stream of chaos energy. The sorcerer made some gestures and tried to cast a portal, but he coughed up blood before he could even finish chanting his incantation. His mana was a pool of uncontrolled mess. There were convergence points everywhere, but the mana was wild and destructive. It could not be tamed. And then, all of a sudden, part of Vilgefortz's fringe was cut off as if done by an invisible pair of scissors. It floated in the air and melted away as a ball of red light engulfed it. Roy was floating before the sorcerer, buffeted by the sea of chaos energy. Even though Vilgefortz was panicking in the face of imminent death, Roy did not glean any satisfaction from it. He just thought it was sad. No matter how powerful someone was, they were all the same in the face of death. Equally weak. He told himself, once we both die, there's nothing to worry about anymore. Still, he was frustrated. He hadn't said goodbye to his friends, family, and lover. And he hadn't met his unexpected child. Is this where I give up? He bared his teeth, his face twitching. The chaos energy was pricking away at him like a sea of needles prickling a human. And then Roy remembered something. Those golden eyes. Wait, I have an idea. Freya's kingdom is right outside the sea. It's around the planet just over yonder. I wonder if she can save me. Lady Freya, 
Roy screamed out to the goddess in his heart, but he gained no response. The suffocation was setting in, and the burning sensation was growing stronger. Roy was then reminded of Freya's suggestion during their last meeting, and her warning about the era of the end. The story about the Ouroboros and the coming white frost, and how those who bear the elder blood could save them all. Roy sighed, Save me, and I shall carry out that duty, and a certain goddess responded to that call. For a moment, the raging stream of colorful energy around Roy and Vilgefortz stopped. A mountainous golden hand appeared from the void of space. It was gigantic enough to blot out the sun, and it tore through the shell of the Sea of Chaos. The hand made its way to the Witcher, going against the stream. Help! Vilgefortz screamed at the hand, expecting it to save him. The hand ignored him. Instead, it gently held the Witcher in its palm, then it slowly moved toward the edge of the strip, as if it were a drakkar slowly taking its passenger to safety. The moving wave was slowly taking Vilgefortz to the outer layer of the strip. Vilgefortz turned his hopeful gaze to the Witcher, who was meditating in the center of the golden palm. Moments ago, they were locked in a deadly battle, but now, Vilgefortz bowed and gave Roy a pleading look. Please, take me with you. I'm sorry, Roy shook his head. Roy was impressed by Vilgefortz's ambition, battle prowess and cunning, but he had no reason to save him, not when this sorcerer would harm him and his loved ones at the first chance he had. And Freya doesn't have enough strength to... The golden hand shook and slammed into the energy sea's reef. It stopped moving, and then the raging sea ate into it. Cracks formed on its surface before it eventually broke apart and disappeared into the air. The hand could not leave the strip of energy. Despair welled within the witcher's heart. Not even a god could save me. If I die here, there's no chance of coming back. Destiny was only fooling around with the witcher, however. Without warning, another golden hand barged into the sea, one that was bigger and more tangible than the first. The caster must be a being of more prominence than even Freya herself. The second hand held the first, and both pulled the witcher out of the energy strip at the same time. Roy was met with a sea of stars and the great darkness around it. A layer of golden light covered Roy, keeping him out of the cosmic rays and unbearable cold. Roy turned his sights to the chromatic glass dome. Within it was a great energy strip surrounding the Witcher world, spinning perpetually. Vilgefortz stood at the edge of the sea, despair filling his eyes. He was slamming away at the dome, but without his mana, his strength alone could not break the dome. The hypothermia and lack of air was turning his face purple. He was a man about to drown, and the raging chaos energy was quickly eating away at his flesh like a group of voracious bugs. The skin on his face wilted and broke down, revealing the bloody muscles underneath. No longer was Vilgefortz the dashing sorcerer he once was. This man was nothing but a grotesque monster. His arrogance was replaced by agony and despair. The sorcerer stared at, the one who had escaped the strip, and he extended his arm as far as possible. He wished to grab onto something, but only the void was caught. Farewell, Vilgefortz. Roy summoned his hand crossbow and fired off a bolt at Vilgefortz's forehead. The black bolt hurtled through the void and pierced the sorcerer's forehead cleanly. Vilgefortz shivered for one last time. His eyes went wide, his muscles slackened, and his pupils dilated. The light within them dimmed, and his fists loosened up. The sorcerer fell into the sea of chaos, his ambition fading away, much like his life. The top brass of the Northern Brotherhood, the legendary sorcerer, the man who assisted Emhir during his ascension, had died. His body disintegrated, turning into particles floating in the Sea of Chaos. Vilgefortz was no more. Vilgefortz killed, EXP plus 8,000, level 13 Witcher 12,014,500. -14 Chapter 559, Aftermath Exquisite aurora strips rained around the Witcher, and then they rose into the air above. A sea of golden souls stood behind the waterfall of aurora, praying like devout believers. Roy had escaped the nightmarish strip of energy and entered the realm of Freya once again. This time, however, he wasn't here in soul only, and there was more than one goddess around. Two golden figures with obscured faces stood within the shifting aurora, near and far at the same time. They gave Roy an audience, and the Witcher felt a little nervous in the presence of not one, but two goddesses. Roy, bearer of the Elder Blood, 
I have responded to your call and risked great danger to save you from the sea of chaos. The voices of a young lady, a pregnant woman, and a crone spoke at the same time. Roy heard them in his mind. And you have promised to carry out the duty. Roy stayed silent. He did say that. And my duty is to protect my believers. However, only the bearer of the elder blood can extinguish the coming crisis. When the end times draw near and the white frost descends, remember your duty and grant salvation to the world or fade into nothingness with it. And tell the ice giant to get back to his post as soon as you can, said Freya. Then your debt to me shall be settled. And do not think you can run to another world in a bid to escape this calamity. A hint of warning seeped into the goddess's voice. The price to pay for a broken word is far heavier than you can imagine. Roy bowed at Freya honestly. If you had not saved me, I would have died with Vilgeforts in the energy strip. No one could escape the Sea of Chaos. Not even someone as talented as Vilgeforts. He didn't have the luxury to refuse his duty. Witchers are people of our word. I will use everything at my disposal to solve the coming calamity. Roy tried to exile Vilgeforts, but he was taken to a goddess abode instead. Perhaps this was what destiny wanted for him. Freya alone could not have saved you. I, too, have incurred a considerable loss, another voice said, and it sounded more majestic and imperious than Freya's. Freya sounded like an affable elder sister, but this one sounded like a stern and arbitrary mother. Her visage was obscured, and her eyes were golden, majestic, solemn, and deep. She was taller and curvier than Freya, and she resembled a female giant. Roy remembered her eyes vividly. Two years ago, he had a glimpse of her in her temple in Elander. Melitele? Melitele was a goddess far older than Freya, and most of the North put their faith in her. Yes, you are not my believer, and so, this rescue does not come without a price, she said. Roy's lips twitched. Oh, great. Now I owe two goddesses a favor? But he didn't mind. Freya's favor alone was already asking him to risk his life. What was one more? He bowed, ready to listen. Melitella softened a little. As you have taken on the role of a savior, then this payment I require will not be as expensive. Until the arrival of the end days, you are required to protect the temple in Elander and my believers, shield them from the ravages of war. As you wish, Melody. The goddesses gazed at the witcher one last time. Never forget your promise, child. We cannot speak to you for long. Every moment you spend in our kingdom is a great toll on the reserves of our faith energy. Leave. The golden goddesses waved at Roy, and the witcher quickly teleported away. The beautiful Aurora disappeared as Roy found himself transported back to solid earth. The skies over Stiga were still ominous, and thunder roared overhead as lightning danced between the clouds. The torrential downpour drenched the parched land underneath, muddying the soil. In the center of the land, Far from the shipwreck of the Drakkar, four towering beasts lay unmoving. Leviathan looked like he was cooked like a steak. His icy blue hair was burned to a crisp, and his skin was fiery red, covered in twisted burn marks and patches of blisters. The rain was pelting it, the air filled with a bizarre stench that was the fusion of cooked meat and body odor. Roy touched the ice giant's arm and was scalded by the sheer heat on the creature's skin. He tried to talk telepathically, but Leviathan did not respond. The severe burns had robbed him of his consciousness, but he's still alive. I can save him. Roy's mana was burning at a blistering rate, converted to the power of healing. Quickly, his mount's wounds were disappearing. Griffin's wounds were a lot less severe, though its thick, lustrous feathers were mostly burned off. It looked more like a vulture than a griffin now. Roy grinned and carefully patted Griffon's bald head. The beast humped and opened its eyes. It saw its master, and that was the sign it could finally vent. Tears fell down its cheeks, and it grabbed the witcher's legs as it nuzzled up to his chest. I'm sorry, girl. Don't cry. If I hadn't been too weak, none of this would have happened. Ifrits were the most destructive of all elementals. Even their young had considerable strength. Not even Roy could confidently come out triumphant from a battle with an Ifrit, let alone his mounts. Fortunately, the moment Vilgeforts was taken to the Sea of Chaos, the Ifrit broke free of his control and returned to the Plain of Fire. The mounts were still alive through pure luck. Roy whipped his hand crossbow out and fired off a couple of bolts. He blinked and returned to the wrecked chamber. 
He then summoned his mounts so they could heal up away from the elements. The witcher popped a dose of healing potion into his mouth. He was about to meditate and replenish his mana, but the couch Vilgefortz toppled at the start of the battle moved. Someone groaned in pain. Roy pulled the couch away and was met with Lydia, Vilgefortz's most trusted lieutenant. She fortunately came out of the ordeal alive, though only just. Her dress was caked in blood, and she had a high fever due to her exhaustion and blood loss. Roy stared at the woman's shifting mask in silence. What should I do with you? Vilgefortz is dead. Should I kill her too? But she's defenseless. The crowd at Novigrad had dispersed, and the corpses of the guards who died in the battle were cleaned up. The downpour came without any warning, drenching the plaza in muddy crimson. Moments later, the blood was whisked away into the gutters and seas of Novigrad, erasing most of the mark of the bloody battle that took place here. The bodies of Skoya Tail members, however, were hung on the plaza as a warning and announcement that they were the masterminds behind this confrontation. The witchers, after the bloody battle, congregated in a brightly lit lab under the Temple Island. They took off their broken and blood-caked armor, switching them out for loose robes. Most of them had bandages wrapped around at least one body part. It almost looked comical, if not for the fact they almost died in the battle earlier. The witchers sat in a circle around a bonfire. So Gigi, I mean Cyrus, blamed everything on Scoyatel? Felix adjusted his glasses, surprise flaring in his eyes. He thought the battle in the Alderwoods was hard enough, but his companions went through something even more life-threatening. The church didn't come after you, even when you killed hundreds of their guards? We wish. Vesemir shook his head. Even with the Hierarch's orders, the guards would kill us if given the chance. Seret dipped a finger into the dwarven spirit in the mug beside him, and the witcher lathered it across the wound on his face. He winced. Most of the guards who died are locals. They have friends and families in this city. About a thousand or two are related to them. The reason doesn't matter. Fact is, we fought, we killed, we made enemies. Lambert smirked at Gerald, who had a bandage around his left forearm. Everyone saw it, and I am not exaggerating. By tomorrow, everyone's going to call us Butchers of Novigrad. Try as they might, the bards won't be able to salvage our reputation. Gerald scratched his nose. He was reminded of his other title, the Butcher of Blaviken. He only slaughtered the bandits to protect the townspeople, but he was charged with a crime in return. The butchering in Novigrad was even more egregious than what Gerald did. They would be cursed for this action. Tension is at an all-time high. Gigi did everything he could to lessen the impact of the confrontation on our reputation, blamed everything on the elves and defended our running of the orphanage. With the King of Beggars, Cleaver, the Collector, and the Knights helping us, the people's hatred is mostly diminished, save for the families of the guards we killed, of course. Can't change the fact that they're scared of us. Felix said, Oh, Gerald, we have a couple of knights at the orphanage waiting for you. Grim and Kahir, they called themselves. They'd like to see you, and they seem genuine. You should check it out once we're done with the aftermath here. They put in a lot of effort to clear our name as well. Geralt nodded. Letho rubbed the salve on the top of his head. Unfortunately for him, part of his scalp was shaved off during the battle, and now his head looked like an egg that wasn't peeled perfectly. It'll take years to turn our reputation around again. We won't be popular among the people, so we'd better lay low. Cohen rubbed his chin. One of the attacks shaved off the pockmark around his beard. It was a pleasant accident. Eskel took a sip of his liquor, his eyes glinting. There was a hint of melancholy on his face. So we can't stay at the house of Gawain anymore? We must leave? The new hierarch did not mandate an expulsion. Lambert looked at his friend enviously, to the point Eskel felt unnerved. Even Carl and the young witchers were staring at Eskel. With his perfect skin and the removal of his scar, Eskel was no longer the rugged witcher he once was. Instead, he was a dashing, sculpted, and muscular hunk. But if we stay, we're bound to be harassed. Incessantly. That's going to hamper the children's training and studies. I've had enough killing for a long while. With our infamy spreading far and wide, you know it will. No one is going to get any ideas. For a while, at least. Geralt held his hands over the open fire. He smiled bitterly. 
I'd rather not fight again for a bit. Seret scanned his brethren. Adamantly, he said, we need to move. If we want any peace and quiet, that is. A deafening silence fell upon the room. The only sounds that remained were the crackling of the flames and the young witcher's heartbeats. Aukis snickered and dusted his bandaged arm off. He broke his arm in battle. You're joking. You're telling us to move just because of the regular man's distaste for us? We've been running this place for years. We have a smithy, a lab, a greenhouse, and the crops are almost ready for harvest. You're telling us to abandon the whole operation and run away? We're the victors here. We can't run. I'd rather fight those bastards again than run away like a coward. We're not running away, Aukis, Vesemir said gently. This is just a temporary relocation. It's a good chance to let the kids explore a different place and learn something different. We'll move back in a couple of years. I've talked to Evelyn, and she's volunteered to stay and keep an eye on the greenhouse and orphanage. I'm staying too. Kian clasped his hands together. He looked at his brethren apologetically. Sorry guys, I'd like to stay with Evelyn and help Kantila out with the potion shop. Akas and Lambert stared at Kian. I see, they drawled. Treasure her, Geralt encouraged. Eskel thought he could stay as well, and he quickly said, I, Vesemir shot him a withering look. You're coming as well. Eskel shut up. Yeah. Lambert smacked his shoulder. And you can bring your succubus along too. Huh? I mean, won't it reflect badly on our reputation? A succubus getting along with a bunch of witchers and children? That's an odd image. He was staring at Lambert, especially, cautious and doubtful of his real intentions. What's with that look? You think I'd sleep with her? Lambert was, red and indignant. All right, shut it. Letho raised his hand. He muttered, but it's not wrong to keep an eye out on Lambert. Now let's get back on track. Kian and Evelyn are staying back, while the kids are moving with us. Dandelion and Cantilla are staying too. They have to run the ballroom and potion shop. Coral and Kalkstein can go anywhere they want, given they have portals. But first, we need to settle on a location. So where are we moving to? And then tension flew in the air. Aside from the nomadic cats, everyone else shot glares at each other, daring the other witchers to make a suggestion. Cohen spoke first. How does Care Saren sound? Kovir and Povis are right beside it. It's a kingdom as bustling as Novigrad, and there's no non-human discrimination. The fortress stands under a snowy mountain, so no one's going to come knocking either. And the seas are bountiful. Food won't be a problem. Yeah, no. Saret shook his head. If another avalanche happens, we're done for. Aw. Cohn's face scrunched up. He was disappointed. Gorthrig Vade, then. Aukis backed his brother up. It's deep in the woods, so we'll have our peace and quiet. And it's near a cliff, so even if there are attacks, we can easily defend it. No. Gorthrig Vade is in the south, and Nilfgaard will launch a war again, I'm sure. Vesemir stroked his beard and shook his head. And you're the ones who told us Emmer has his eyes on the fortress. Geralt and Lambert exchanged a look. They spoke at the same time. That leaves us with one place, the fortress in Cadwin and home of the wolves, Kaer Morin. Their voices were trembling with excitement, excitement of going home. And this time, they were bringing along a group of students with them. Their predecessors would be overjoyed if they knew. Kaer Morin is thousands of miles away from Yaruga. Nilfgaard's troops won't be attacking anytime soon. And it's a beautiful place, quiet too, and bountiful, and it has something crucial for the trial, the circle of elements. Aukis cocked his eyebrow and complained, now you're just abusing your power to get what you want. Someone's jealous, Lambert mocked. See brothers, Carl interrupted carefully. This was the apprentice's first time joining a witcher meeting as an equal. After the battle, the veterans showed them more trust. Roy's not back yet. I think we should wait for him before we make a decision. The other apprentices nodded quickly, and then everyone looked worried. The concern in Letho's eyes flickered for a moment. I wonder if he's fine. He then shook his head and smiled. He probably is. Maybe he's having fun somewhere out there. I don't know. Gawain said he went after that sorceress. He summoned Griffon and that ice giant away too. Alcus massaged his temples. He might have a tough customer on his hands and then a gale screamed through the lab. A black portal tore through the air, and a slender figure leapt into the crowd, haggard and exhausted. 
Behind him was a vulture with all its feathers plucked. Griffin hid behind its master, burying its face in his shoulders. Roy looked around, and a smile curled his lips. Roy, kid, you left the plaza out of nowhere. Where'd you go? Roy heaved a sigh of relief. I had to deal with a certain guy. Would have been a thorn in our side if left unchecked. Good to see everyone's fine. Had a bit of trouble, but he's done for now. Reince and his master won't be a problem anymore. Wait, what's that supposed to mean? Sarat asked nervously, and the other witchers turned their eyes to Roy. Long story. Then take a seat. Letho tossed a bottle of dwarven liquor to Roy and beckoned him. And give us all the details. It's a shocking tale, so let's save it for last. Where are Coral and Kalkstein? Roy sat in the center and held his hands over the open fire. His perlicue had cracked from overexertion. The witcher had a smile of relief on his face, glad to find that all his brethren were in one piece. Rience's masters left a mountain of valuables, and I need an experi and said sorcerer to deal with it, and there's a little errand they have to run. Chapter 560 Influence In a quiet cave in Dalblathana, home of flowers and elves, Philavandrel and Francesca congregated. The spies have news, Daisy. All the children we sent to Novigrad to assist Vilgeforts have died. Philavandrel was in white, and he stood before Daisy. There was a sorrowful smile on his face. Not even the sorcerers made it. Francesca stared at the Xenobox. She'd been waiting for a response, but so far, it was dark. Tears glistened in her beautiful blue eyes. Cyrus, the hierarch of the Eternal Fire, ordered for their bodies to be hung in the plaza as a warning and remembrance for those who died in the battle, said Phil of Andrel, his voice choking. But the truth is, most of the guards were killed by the witchers, and yet the hierarch pinned the blame on the children. It's like he's gone mad. Not an ounce of blame was pinned on the witchers. The Northern Realms now know of this confrontation, and the kings have taken notice of Scoia'tael, the extremely anti-human organization. Philavandrel stared at Francesca, his gaze questioning. This is vastly different from what Vilgefortz promised. He clenched his gloves tightly, his knuckles white. Is this all a joke to him? Is our future nothing but his plaything? Francesca's shoulder shivered. She caressed the Xenovox's crystal and stared at the screen in the air. It disappeared the moment it formed, and again and again and again the elf watched. Eventually, she said, I can't establish contact with Vilgforts anymore. A tear fell down her cheek. It was shed for her fallen brethren. He tosses us aside after we outlive our usefulness? What does he think the children are? Pawns? Philavendrel's eyes were filled with the flames of fury, his voice scraping and hard. Did he betray us? Francesca shook her head. He has no reason to. We're Nilfgaard's allies. There must be something else. Something more important than the children? I will demand an explanation, but not now, and I'll be asking someone else for help down the line. He put the children in the line of danger, caring not for their safety. Are we still going to antagonize the Northern Realms for him even after this? The ex-Elven king stared into Francesca's profile, hoping she would say no. What we're doing next is not for him, it's for the future for our children to have a place they can call home, for them to never have to hide in the mountains and starve. Francesca extended her right hand. An Apollo butterfly fluttered into the cave and landed on her sleeve, its wings flapping. We have reached an agreement with Emire. The war shall begin soon. As the Eternal Fire has chosen to antagonize us and side with the witchers who have slaughtered our children, we will burn them down with the fire of vengeance. Calmly, she ordered, tell Isengrim Faultiarna to lead a brigade to Brokolon. They shall work with the nymphs and attack humans as they see fit. Should they run into any danger, Ithne will provide them protection. Evelyn, Tolivire, and Kenzafa will lead a brigade to the borders of Blue Mountains and gather allies among the discriminated non-humans. There, they will be engaging in skirmishes. Is this worth it? Philavandrel asked. Most of them are going to end up dead. Perhaps staying at the Blue Mountains could give them a better chance at survival? Keeping to ourselves will only lead to extinction. We must strike out and at least reclaim Dalblathana. We must battle against the humans and stop them should they start preparing for war. This is the agreement we made with Emhire, and we can't break our word. I am sorry, Philavandrel. Philavandrel bowed. 
I forgive you, Enid, but I do not know if the children who will sacrifice themselves will. A gale hurtled into the window of Stiga, rustling the countless tomes on the bookshelves. Lita looked at the flash of magical light from the Xenovox beside the vat, and she frowned. This marks the tenth time. She was more than surprised. They've been trying to contact Vilgeforts for a while now. Probably doesn't know. S. Dead. Lita's eyes twinkled. Even now, she still couldn't believe that Roy killed Vilgeforts and reduced him to atoms. And he did it quietly, too. Just like that, the top sorcerer and the continent's most desired man was gone. If Roy hadn't taken her to Stiga and shown him Vilgeforts's most trusted lieutenant being an inch away from death, she'd have thought he was joking about Vilgeforts's death. Before this visit, she had no idea the dashing, talented, respected, and beloved Vilgeforts was a maniac who loved to torture the innocent. She saw his lab. It was filled with torture devices, syringes, a custom-made electric chair, and dozens of skeletons belonging to his test subjects. And to make things worse, he was already in cahoots with the South and betrayed the Brotherhood. The man was nothing but scum. He's not in the top brass for nothing. His collection of books is almost complete, and they're all valuable. Let's see. My estimation puts the number of books here at about one-fifth of what Bannard's library has. It's like a small magical academy here. The mousy, balding Kalkstein was holding a thick tome. He had a mischievous grin on his face, his robe swaying as he walked. And this is an out-of-print edition of The Mysteries of Natural Magic. Once I'm done with this, I'm sure I can be a better alchemist. Pity that his most valuable items are destroyed. He wouldn't keep it anywhere but his personal inventory space. Kalkstein thought that was a shame. He had no idea that Roy had told Coral to tuck away the files of Vilgefortz's greatest and most terrible project of all, the extraction of the Elder Blood. That file was on the list of forbidden books. This isn't a bad castle, however. It's right beside Ebbing's Stone Lake. A remote place, a no-man's land, a spacious spot, and it comes with a fully decked-out lab. We have enough gemstones and magical materials to last us for decades. Why don't we move our lab here, Lita? We don't have to. Lita shook her head. From now on, Stiga, the underground chamber of Temple Island, and the lab under the Valley of the Nines Lake will be the Brotherhood's shelters. Good idea. Kalkstein flipped the tome open and skimmed through the pages. Nonchalantly, he asked, So how are you going to deal with Lydia? Coral was in silence for moments. She did not expect Roy to keep Lydia around. She could be a problem. Lydia's not even fifty years old. She's just a girl who fell for that conspirator's brainwashing. I'll lead her back to the straight and narrow. The evening sun drenched the skies in a warm shade of red. Gusts of breeze sauntered across the courtyard, dancing with the branches of the weeping willows like they were in a slow waltz. After the battle, the orphanage once again saw the children moving around its grounds. Vicky was within the lab, holding bags of potions. She stared at the vials and vessels on the workstation, reluctant to leave them behind. I, I don't have enough space for my babies. Stop crying, Vicky. Renee grinned, though she barely had any teeth. She quickly tucked a bunch of dried celandines and buckthorns into her blouse's pockets, filling them up until they were about to burst. She almost looked like a squirrel hoarding nuts for winter. Letho said Cadwin has everything. We'll get whatever we want once we're there. And it's time we get new stuff, right, Conrad? The boy beside the furnace nodded. He looked outside the window, melancholy flickering on his face. Everyone was busy outside. Akamathorm was standing behind Felix. He had changed into a new set of armor, and the boy looked lively. He was holding a crate half the height of an adult, as he slowly ambled toward the portal before the conference room. Carl grinned and kicked the butt of his companion. The dozen or so apprentices were huddled around the young witchers, their eyes shining with worship. They wanted to know everything about the battle that took place in Novigrad. Oreo, Terry, and Bim were saddled with a few sacks of seeds, and in their hands were farmy, in tools, and archery gear. They were following Serret around. Quintus, Fyodor, and the Tordorok blacksmiths donned their favorite apron, holding their hammers tightly. They were a little nervous about their new home. The bald griffin had a pile of luggage on its back, and it covered up its bald spots perfectly, or griffin would die from the embarrassment alone. 
Ebony was happily barking at it, all the while licking its beak. Eskels, Geralt's, Roy's, and Lambert's horses were huddled in a circle within the crowd, whinnying and braying amongst themselves. The other students were in their bedrooms, excitedly tucking away their bedrolls, clothes, and notebooks. All were engaged in conversations regarding their upcoming travels. They were red with excitement, but they were also nervous and slightly reluctant to leave. Conrad muttered, It's only been two years. I can't believe we're moving already. Ah, chin up. You're a boy. Besides, Vesemir said, We can always come back. Rene harumphed but she too puckered her lips and the rims of her eyes were red. This beautiful little compound had given them so many memories to treasure their whole lives. Vicky pursed her lips, determination flaring in her eyes. That's why we have to grow stronger, strong enough to keep our home safe. We're not going to just hide and pray for them next time. Yeah. The witchers were gathered outside the fence, saying goodbye to their friends and acquaintances in Novigrad. Care Morin is a long trip from Novigrad. Please, take care of yourselves. Dandelion looked at the witchers sadly. For once, he switched out his pretentious outfit for a more solemn gray jacket. Don't worry about us. My friends will be working with Cyrus to turn your reputation around as fast as they can. And with the coins Roy borrowed from the usurer, our next step will be opening up a branch in Redania. I promise that in a year at most, everyone will hail you as heroes again. That's what bards do. Novigrad is home to more than 30,000 people. A couple of thousand dissenters is nothing. You and your bad habit of bragging. Geralt shook his head. You don't have to worry about us. Worry about yourself. If you run around and sleep with any random woman you meet, someday someone is going to cut off your junk. He looked at the beautiful Priscilla. Except she was in a blue, tight-fitting shirt with orange sleeves. Stay loyal to your lover. Don't insult me, Geralt and I can say the same to you. Do not desert Yennefer again, and stop sleeping around. There are no other women in Kaer Morhen. It's in the middle of nowhere. One more stupid reply, and I'll shut you up with Yurden. Hey, Dandelion, Cohn gave Jaskier a pleading look. Take care of Ixena while I'm gone. He then turned to the woman beside him. She was dressed in the latest fashion. Ixena held his arm and stared into his eyes with love. I'll come back once a month or so. Out of love for poetry and stage plays, Ixena stayed behind. Cohen was a member of the Brotherhood, and given his upbringing as a knight, he could not leave the kids or his brethren alone. And so, he chose to leave with them. Don't you worry. Dandelion patted Cohen's shoulder and gave him a wink. Priscilla and I are going to make her into a star. She'll be the branch's showrunner. Another couple was also present, though they were not exactly in the crowd. The handsome Eskel was engaged in a quiet conversation with a ravishing exotic woman. She had horns on her head, and her skin had a healthy tan. Her eyes twinkled with hope, and she was talking about building a home with Eskel in Kaer Morhen. Roy pulled back his hand from the cloth that swaddled Mino, and he found his palm drenched. His lips twisted downward. Mino blinked at his brother and gurgled, then he grabbed Roy's finger and sucked on it. Moore and Susie were in the courtyard, saddled with cooking utensils. They smiled at their sons. Shortly after their arrival at the house of Gawain, they took up the menial jobs around the orphanage, including farming swar, cooking, and cleaning. They were indispensable stewards for the orphanage, and they too would be going to care Morhen with the group. Roy's goal was further beyond this, of course. The Witchers shouldn't limit their base of operations to the south and the north, though he would need the help of two other elder bloodbearers to realize that ambition, and one of them was yet unborn. Calanthe's delivery is expected to be two months after we move to Kaer Morhen. I should be preparing for the third trial, too. Rustling footsteps came from the woods' entrance. Aiden stepped into the courtyard, followed by a pair of burly, armored, and motivated knights. Grim? Kahir? Hello, witchers. Geralt? Grim smiled at everyone. He was excited to be met with more than a dozen witchers. Finally, we meet. But before we talk, we have a humble request. Will you hear us out? I don't see why not. Geralt stepped forth and, and nodded at the knights. He was more than willing to give them a chance, given how they defended the witchers and put in a good word for them. Still, he was wary about Kahir, given that he was a Nilf guardian and Ciri's former captor. 
I would like to go on this journey with you, as a guest, and I would like to spar with everyone. Grim leaned on his greatsword, his eyes shining as brightly as the sun. I, Kahir bowed. He was tense, and he stiffly requested, I would like to see Siri once more, Geralt, if that is possible with you.